Karen, which is our apologies. Do we have any apologies, Karen? We have apologies from Ivan Conford, Gary Malone, Charlie Sinclair, and Drew Walker. And uh, Drew's proxy for today is Andrew Bradley. Okay, that's lovely. Thank you. Welcome, Andrew, to today's meeting. Um, we'll move on to agenda item number two, which is declarations of interest. Do we have any declarations of interest from around the room? No. Just, again, if you just bear with us as we just go through and check, uh, just to make sure there is no raised hands. No, there's not. I can't see No, it. not seen any. Um, Councillor Miles, sorry. Okay, yeah. Councillor Miles. Yeah, no, it was just, uh, I muted myself thinking it would be safer, but then discovered you can't unmute yourself again. So uh, it's just a, a housekeeping there. If, if, uh, if it's possible, but maybe the host says, if you mute yourself, you have to be unmuted by the host. Is that correct? Yes. It's, it, if you can, um, Professor Miles, if you can just leave yourself leave unmuted. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I'm just going to give my own hands up as well to declare an interest um, in agenda items number nine and ten. Uh, it's non-financial interests, and I will still take part in discussion. Okay, Karen? Yep. That's great, thank you. Okay, so we will move on to agenda item number three, which is, which is our minutes, including the action log. So 3A, our previous minutes, um, meeting minutes. Um, do we have any questions or any comments? Again, if you just bear with us as we go through, just to check, is everybody happy to agree the meeting minutes from the last meeting? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that appears to be a yes, Karen. Okay, thank you. Yep, yeah. thank you. Okay, 3B, our action log. Do we have any comments or questions? There doesn't appear to be anyone, so we're happy to agree. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. That takes us on to agenda item number four, which is our COVID-19 update. And I will hand you over to Gail Smith, um, our interim chief executive, who will take you through this. Thank you, Gail. Thank you. Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself for, for the last item um, here, but I've managed to get off now. Thank you, Andrew. Okay. Um, yes, the COVID-19 update um, is a report updating you from all of our work over the last three months. Um, it's actually four months. However, it's three months today since we've, we've been in lockdown. I'm sure the majority of you are well aware of that. However, firstly, I would like to commend the whole of um, Angus Health and Social Care Partnership and our colleagues with this report because it's just such a sterling effort that we have made across Angus to deal with this. I think you'll, you'll all agree that this is uh, the amount of work that has happened and taken place has been phenomenal. Um, I won't go through it, Chair, bit by bit because I think the current position very much summarises and bullet points most of the activity that we've put in place there. And also we've highlighted in our recovery, though it doesn't feel like we're, we're in recovery at the moment, though we are planning for that recovery phase, hopefully over the next few weeks. Um, but nonetheless, <coughs> we have a, specially, a special recovery focused strategic planning group now, and we've had two of the meetings have been held recently, and we've also got our senior leadership team with the same focus. We have a remobilisation plan in place until the end of July. For those of you that don't know, the remobilisation plans are put in place for 100 days. Who would have thought that here we are in July that we've got to plan another mobilisation plan? But that's the situation. Throughout our work, um, the meeting groups that I've highlighted have considered all of the challenges, the positives, and they're in the process of capturing the learning and also looking at the next stage of the review of where we go now. Um, there are different areas that I think you'll see throughout 
throughout the report in section three that um, we'll take any questions about over this time. But some of the priorities that were bullet pointed one to 14 are about reinforcing these existing priorities and including some of the new ones. Going forward, it still feels a period of uncertainty and I'm sure that's the case for the majority of you your, yourselves. But within Angus and our Health and Social Care Partnership, I want to reassure you that we will continue to work to embed the positive changes in practice that we've been, we've been learning from throughout this three month period. And we're looking for what we can put in place around sustainability and reliability. There are a number of financial implications. I don't know if our Chief Finance Officer wants to speak to these here or throughout his finance report. But I'd like to bring, bring in Gillian Dalloway at this stage as well, who's been instrumental, um, as is George, in pulling all of this together. Jill, are you there? I can't see you on the screen. Yeah, I'm, I'm here, Gail. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Chair, for the opportunity just to pick up on a, a couple of key points. Um, I think Gail's highlighted, obviously, the, the work that's been ongoing across the partnership over the last um, what feels like way more than four months. We've, we've got to this point um, and the, the commitment and the dedication of the staff has, has been absolutely paramount in, in us being able to achieve what we have been able to. I think just picking up on a key part of that, the adaptability of the staff um, on top of that commitment and dedication has actually allowed us to do things very, very differently um, and they've really embraced that. Um, and that, that's the staff from the partnership, from the NHS, but also volunteers. Um, and unpaid carers and other carers. But in addition to that, the population have also adapted the way that they have um, rallied around and helped each other and some of their expectations of what they expect from um, the, the partnership and key NHS services. I think just to, to pick up on a couple of key points um, of areas that I think will be of uh, interest, um, the has been a significant amount of work done around the digital working and how to progress that um, and that is one of the, the huge positive things that we will look to embed um, within the services and the excellent work that we've had at working across um, the partnership, working across the whole system including both NHS and um, Angus Council um, and with our third sector and independent providers as well and that's come from the start of the, the pandemic, we've been working very, very closely um, with them and I know that um, George will pick up on the work with the independent providers um, and there's obviously a paper around care homes um, that, that's coming. Bill's also been um, involved in it from a health and wellbeing perspective and I think health and wellbeing of our staff um, has been critical as well and we have to look after our staff because they, they were becoming knackered. Um, and we have undertaken a, a, a survey um, around that. We had about a 10% response rate, um, and that was very positive. Some of the, the feedback and comments from the staff um, were very positive, and we have been able to establish the, the restrooms in um, our key areas um, to allow staff to get a bit of that downtime um, as well. Um, I'm just going to hand over to George to come in um, if he's got anything he wants to add around the recovery and the, the discussions that we're having with the strategic planning group to take forward some of those positive um, changes. Thanks, Gillian. Uh, the strategic planning group had a, a special session looking at uh, COVID-19 and its impact and planning ahead for the future, uh, as did the senior leadership team. And I suppose that the most striking thing to come out of those sessions was the level of positivity uh, around the, the, the whole business. Now, I would say it's been grueling for the staff, would be the way to put it, and for managers as well. And it, it, it seems odd to say something positive when there have been so many deaths, and especially deaths in care homes. But the, the, the feeling from uh, the strategic planning group and SLT was that the partnership's held together very well, it's been really tested but there's been genuine partnership working. All the bits of, of the partnership have felt equal and, and, and have contributed really strongly. Um, Gillian's already mentioned the uh, carers and, and the third sector, but they're certainly worth a mention again, I think. 
they really have risen to the challenge. Um, I think there are some positive things coming out of it. Um, and, and in particular, I think probably the relationship with the independent sector providers, which was already really strong through Help to Live at Home and Care at Home. But I think there's a real opportunity to strengthen that in the residential care sector. And one of, that was one of our strategic uh, planning objectives. I'll not say too much about residential care because there's a separate report coming in uh, about that. Uh, recovery, I, I would say we're not yet really in the recovery phase, not when we're so caught up with the residential care home business. Um, but I, I would say we're rather in a, a preparation for recovery phase. And, and, and many things um, we need to, if you like, get permission from the Scottish Government in the next phase of, of, of reducing lockdown. So things like family visits and reopening at family visits and care homes, reopening daycare, reopening our learning disability day centres, and emergency respite, uh, sorry, planned respite rather than emergency respite. So we really need to move on to the next phase before we can uh, enact those things, but we have plans in place for them. Um, I'm personally quite concerned about the, the longer term impact of the loss of some services, um, or the suspension of some services, to be the best way to put it. So the things I've mentioned, disability day centres, um, you know, uh, daycare, uh, respite provision, and just a lot of normal healthcare provision that we would take for granted, dentistry, and, and uh, from, from the, the fairly everyday preventative health services to the really serious end uh, of care around cancer and heart conditions, for example, a lot of which has, has been suspended. So I think the long, there's a long-term impact around some of that stuff. Um, in my portfolio, I'm particularly worried about the pressure on carers with the, with the loss of those services for a number of months. Um, and I think we're, we're, we're going to have to really pour in the support, if you like, when we get permission to do it. So we're planning for recovery now, um, but we're not quite there yet, I would say. And I think what we'll do is we'll have our plans ready to go. And when we get the the nod of approval, we'll, we'll bash on with that. Okay, thank you, George. Um, thank you, Gillian. Um, is there any comments or questions um, yeah. from anyone or any questions and comments yes. from anyone? Yeah? Yeah, my hands up. Yeah, my hands up. Not, is it up? Um, Sorry, I'm just not getting to your scene. You're on, you know, on the gadget. Oh, on you go. <laughs> well, first of all, apologies for for putting my hand up 20 minutes ago, it seems like, but I was just fiddling about with it. Um, anyway, um, I'd like to, I personally, on behalf of all the service users, like to thank all the, the leadership team, the staff, the independent sector and the, and the third sector for all the work that they've done. I'm very, very impressed and very humbled and, and pleased with the way the, the Angus Health and Care Partnership has worked. It really, it really highlights the role of, of I, IT and technology enabled care as has already been mentioned by I think Gail in a report or Jill, I think it was. Um, and it does also, unfortunately, technology leads to inequalities and in, in, inequity uh, as far as access to IT. So I'm particularly pleased to see on page 18 or page 3 of the report or page 18 of the combined report the last paragraph about commencement of a free two-month trial for a simple digital device for vulnerable adults without who can't uh, access digital technology what and very quickly what what is it and what what will it do and I don't know, is it probably Jill to answer that one? Or? I'm just Sally. interested in more details about it. Yeah, Sally. Sally. Yeah. Sally. John, can you unmute Sally, please? Sally Wilson. <coughs> Hello. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to tell you about this device. It's a very simple device called Comp, and it comes from Norway. And basically, it looks like a very old fashioned television set and it allows uh, service users uh, relative to communicate with them 
it, the service user themselves wouldn't be able to um, call like on a telephone they're, they're, um, because it's, it's so simple that it's for people who aren't used to using telephones and are perhaps used to using a television. And um, so we have this three month, uh, sorry, two month trial. I did try my hardest. I'm normally very successful in getting longer trials, but no, they were insistent that it's a two month trial. It has been with somebody in a residential home to begin with, and it's now going out to somebody in their own home. We are hoping that we'll be able to link with um, carers, as in um, members of our support services as well. But we have IT governance issues, unfortunately, they're a bit of a stumbling block in that respect. But we hope next month we'll be able to coordinate the care of a person with their family and with um, somebody from um, who is providing services to them. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Sally. Does that answer it for you? Yes, Andrew? it does. Thank, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions Chair. or comments? Chair, yeah, Councillor Bell. Councillor Bell, and then I noticed Hugh's hand was up, but Julie, do you want to okay. go first? Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to say that um, throughout the whole audit committee this morning, the, you know, the, these issues uh, and the, the forward planning uh, and any impact on our strategic planning were very much part of the conversation. Um, so that was that was healthy. And, and likewise, Andrew had uh, made those same comments there, which, which is great. But I have a couple of questions. Um, one for Jill. Um, around our staff and the health and well-being there and I'm really pleased that there have, have been ways of supporting staff at work but have there been any issues or will there be any issues uh, as we progress around uh, taking back flexi or toil um, you know any additional hours worked um, just curious about that I see Gail shaking her head and the other question was for um, George has the cessation of our day and community-based services, um, has, has that had a negative impact on people's health and well-being and resulted in perhaps an earlier admission to a hospital or into residential care? Okay, so Gillian, are you, Gillian Galloway, are you going to answer first and then yeah. over to George after? Happy to pick um, that up. Um, and in fact, it's the opposite, Julie. We're encouraging staff to take leave um, as much as possible. But I would defer to Bill um, because he's been our key workforce link um, throughout this um, as well. So he'll probably want to come in on that. But we're actively encouraging people to take time off. Yes, we are. And uh, both our employers, Angus Council and NHS Tayside, we've got clear guidance um, for this, but we're also waiting for their guidance around um, holiday leave and the, the quarantine, etc. But we're following what is the Scottish Government's um, instruction is that staff should not be financially penalised um, due to COVID. So we're working within these principles. Okay, thank you, Gillian. Thank you, Bill. I am, um, and I think George, is it George that's going to come in and answer sure. these other questions, please? Well, I suppose, um, first of all, Julie, I would say it's to a large extent just common sense, if you like, that we know that if we close down these support services for three months, as we've had to do, that it will have, over time, uh, a negative impact on, on families and real, real pressure on carers. But you know, we've moved a bit from the anecdotal to the actual, if you like, through some of the consultations that we've been doing around disability services are going to get mentioned later on. And, and, and did a report on the carers as well. So Peter has been flagging up um, some of the concerns that carers have been, been expressing about the pressures from the, the suspension of those services. So we know it's having an impact. I don't think we know the full extent of that impact, and we might not know that until things get back to a bit more normality. Um, it hasn't resulted in increased admissions to care homes, certainly, um, because the um, number of people in care homes has gone down quite markedly. Uh, during the, the, the pandemic or this phase of the pandemic. And I think that's because a lot of our systems are not quite running the way they would. It's probably because um, 
people are less inclined to, to admit folk to care homes because of the worry about uh, catching the infection. Um, so it's not translating in that way, but I do uh, still think it's a concern that we will have to pick up on. I wouldn't say that we have uh, done nothing for, for folk who are in that position because quite a number of staff have been redeployed into doing outreach work. So we have tried to, to uh, plug the gap with, with outreach work, but it's not quite the same, I, I would say. Okay, thank you, George. Julie, does that answer everything for you, or do you have any follow-ups? No, I mean, it, that, yes, it, that confirms what I thought. And I know some, you know, third sector day services have been trying to communicate with people electronically and keep that going in, in some way, which is great. Um, but I, I had had anecdotal evidence uh, or um, testimony from some of those services about um, their their people. Um, so I just wondered if there was anything more tangible. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, George. There is, Julie, a, a, an overlap with personal care provision, of course, but a number of folk will be still receiving personal care because it's continued throughout the, the pandemic. So, you know, the, 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 the carers will um, let care management know if they're really concerned about the pressures there as well. Care managers will be checking that out with, with people that are doing personal care. Okay, thanks, George. Do we have any other questions or comments? I noticed, Peter, your hands up and you come yeah, to Chair, Chair Emma Jane as well. Okay, thank you. It's a, a follow-up to George's point about the, the cessation of things like day services, waiting for um, government advice. Do you have a feel for when you will get some advice um, from the government about um, how things can move forward, George? Uh, pretty soon, I think, Peter. That's not very precise, but I would think in the next couple of weeks we're going to get some uh, further information about that. Um, I know that quite a lot of organisations are, are, are pressing the government about this issue. Um, one issue, for example, is the issue about visiting people in care homes, which I mentioned. And I know there were meetings uh, last week between Scottish Care and the government. Uh, there wasn't any change as a result of that, but I, I, my feeling is it's in the wind uh, and coming fairly soon. <laughs> Good. Um, just a, a, a follow up to Julie's question and George's response. I know of no um, admissions to hospital as a result of extra burdens on carers. Um, but anecdotally, um, we know that carers are getting very, very stressed that they're finding it more and more difficult to care for their people. Um, so the sooner these things are lifted, the, the, the better. Um, on the other hand, um, as George pointed out, a lot of the uh, day centre staff have been redeployed. Um, they're doing a lot of outreach. Um, uh, the Lachlan's site in uh, our Broth is actually running a Facebook group, which is keeping everybody in touch, posting lots of photographs of each other and commenting on, on how everybody's doing. So that's a very positive step. Um, in terms of care management support uh, and outreach from care managers, that would appear to be patchy. Um, in some cases, it's very, very good. In others, it's uh, lacking somewhat. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, can I just move on to Emma Jane? Do you want to come in, Emma? Thank you, Chair. Um, my uh, comment really was in, uh, or question was in relation to the health and well that's mentioned in the, the mention of the, the rollout of the RRR rooms and I think this probably alludes to the areas that have been created uh, across Tayside with funding from the, the Tayside Health Fund um, and I just wanted to um, just to highlight that more funding is going to be available and um, so that funding from the NHS Strategies Together program um, and there is going to be a tranche that's focused on providing longer term mental health support for staff that will be coming later in the summer and I think the health fund would be really keen to work with health and well-being teams across Tayside to look at ways that that funding could be deployed to provide that longer term mental health support so I'm really keen to, to speak to, to Gail or whoever um, with regard to moving forward. Okay. Thanks, Emma Jane. Gail, do you want yeah, to come in, response, in there? In response to Emma Jane's point, that's very much appreciated. That would be great. I'll defer that over to Bill Troop 
to take the lead for us, Emma Jane, on our on behalf of the partnership. I'm going to go back, sorry, to Councillor Bell's previous point about encouraging our staff to take time off. We absolutely are, because I know from a personal point of view and our exec team how tired and how hard everybody's been working. So um, it's really important that people get that opportunity to get a break. Um, so yes, I absolutely support that. Okay, thank you, Gail. Just looking round, have we got any other questions? Hugh, I noticed your hands up. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, at the side wide level and at a national level, we hear great stories about the use of uh, the Near Me video consultation. And I know that at a side level, the numbers of usage have rocketed dramatically. The figures we've got for their use in GP practice in Angus indicate that it was used in 25 consultations in March. That had only increased to 94 in May. And the face of it, that doesn't seem a, a, a big increase. Would, would someone like to comment on that? Okay, can, I ask, you. Doc, yeah. can I ask Dr Clement and Sally Wilson to comment on that, please? Yeah, so it's, it's important when you're using technology to apply it in uh, situations where it's going to be of benefit. So while GP practices have access to Near Me, they are not choosing to use Near Me for all consultations. And that is because largely they're finding that telephone consultations and people that you know with the patient record in front of you is, is um, working effectively. I think where it's something Thing like a skin rash and you would expect to see somebody because it can help the added benefit would be for examination what the feedback I'm receiving is that by asking somebody to email you a photograph of what it is then that has been effective so very important when we're thinking about new technology that we don't look at the numbers only at the numbers of how things are um, you know, thinking that quality or benefit to the patient, a patient relevant outcome is dependent on the number. We need to look at the evidence about how use of technology actually benefits patient relevant outcomes. So I would say that Near Me is something that's been promoted. One of our local GPs is a national leader around Near Me, and we are very keen to uh, adopt new technology, but it has to be where it's of most benefit. Effort. And so examples would be where we are using it is thinking in Angus about the six week review in care homes. Um, we, could we use Near Me for something that's a bit more delicate and that actually requires that face to face contact when you're talking about anticipatory care planning? Or um, we're actually talking the polypharmacy reviews. Well, we could do that by teleconferencing because you can fit more than three people on at the same time. So it really is about having the clinical and I would say professional leadership. So I would include social workers, care managers, people themselves in determining what the need is and then looking for the technology solutions to support it. But we are very key in Angus in the clinical community on Near Me. And I would add in the psychiatry of old age service that there's advantages, but there has been not every service in Tayside from the NHS perspective has had Near Me at the same time. And some of the um, our services have been a wee bit later to have uh, adequate amounts of near me. So it's all work in progress and we certainly are continuing to progress it through the clinical partnership group and in other areas. Okay, thanks, Alison. Thank you. Alison, anyone else? Okay, we've got Gillian Galloway and Sandy's hands up. Okay, Gillian, then Sandy, please. Thank you, Peter. It was just to, to highlight um, in terms of um, I, I did forget to mention it at the start of the work with it, Alice, who had led around the pathways um, and the work with secondary care as well. It's certainly worth noting um, the interface between um, primary and secondary care and the tremendous amount of work that has been put into developing those pathways as well. Okay, thanks, Gillian. Sandy? Yeah, thanks, Chair. I, I just wanted to come back to the, the finance section, which I know Gail referenced right at the beginning. Um, the, the kind of trying to put a, a cost and capture all the financial implications of COVID is, is very difficult. And hope that, hopefully that's kind of come across in, in the, the extract of the paper that we've got there. It's, it's due to the things that we all know. How long will this go on for? How, how intense will the effect be? And things like that. Um, 
what it's worth keeping in mind is that while there's lots of different characteristics of the cost, um, your new costs, additional costs for, for certain services we're running already, um, some costs we think we have or think might happen and then actually don't transpire, what we do know for definite is that it's still very much an evolving picture. Uh, and since we put the numbers together for this report, um, there's been you know, a lot of further Scottish Government guidance coming out. Um, and it'll be things that many of you are familiar with, um, changes in the, our, our relationships and support packages for independent sector, uh, changes to things like um, some sickness pay arrangements for people again working in the independent sector, and also things like testing arrangements. So all those things will be additional costs and additional commitments that we have to meet and additional costs associated with them. So it's uh, perfectly reasonable at the moment to think that the next time we do a revision of the cost, the next time we, we share that update with the IJB, the cost would potentially be, for some parts of it, and maybe the whole thing, uh, higher than we've, we've estimated so far. But as I say, that, that affects very much an evolving position, partly due to um, changes in the commitments and requirements on, uh, placed on ourselves. And ultimately, things like duration and intensity will be a big factor in, in how much these uh, all kind of add up to in terms of financial implication. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sandy, for that update. I'm just going round um, you all just to, to check as I flick through the screen to see if there is any other hands up. I don't think there appears to be, Karen. No, I've sure seen anyone. Yeah. Nope. Okay, thank you. And I guess to add my own comments, um, I guess Hugh doesn't know this, but there has definitely been, uh, you know, quite a few times this week and, and even up until mid-morning where I I guess I was finding I was struggling and, and almost was going to pick up that phone to Hugh to say, I think you're going to need to step in here because I'm flagging. Um, and I guess, you know, why I've managed to be here is because I'm just fully, fully conscious that we are all in this storm together and that we might not all be in the same boat, but... Um, you know, I'm sure many of you will have had your days where it's been difficult and certainly many within your teams uh, will, be, will be struggling. And I guess my kind of, uh, I guess this one is, is for the partnership and, uh, and for those across all sectors, including our service users and carers and not forgetting Catherine, Lindsay and her team and all the tremendous work that's, that's going on. Um, so this one is for you guys and, uh, you know, we will get through this. So my thanks and appreciation uh, for the remarkable works that's going on. And to those especially that are struggling, you know, just keep hanging in there because we are in this together. So thank you. And I'll go on to the, the recommendations and I'll just read them through. Um, so recommendation 1.1 is that we note the actions that have been advanced by the Health and Social Care Partnership and key stakeholders in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. 1.2, that we note and commend the effort, adaptability, professionalism and compassion shown by staff and stakeholders across the Angus Health and Social <coughs> Care Partnership during this period. Do we agree? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Agree. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> That takes us on now to agenda item number five, um, which is our Angus Care Home COVID-19 pandemic response update. And again, I will hand you over to Gail Smith. Uh, Gail, if you could just talk to this report. Thank you. Yes, this is uh, Angus Care Home COVID-19 pandemic response. And for those of you that don't know, the Scottish Government introduced new legislation and new measures to ensure much more clarity around the professional accountabilities for supporting aspects for people within care homes. Angus Health and Social Care Partnership were actually very quick off the mark when that legislation was introduced, which was on the 17th of May, which actually to us seems like months ago with the amount of effort and time that this is taking from all of us to ensure that the care of people in care homes is paramount. Since that announcement by the Scottish Government, what we did is we established a local multi-agency operational group, which is chaired by Dr. Alison Clement. And that group feeds through into the NHS Tayside Oversight Group, which is co-chaired by Claire Pierce, the Director of Nursing, and Dr. Drew Walker, the Director of Public Health. Both Catherine Lindsay and myself sit on that group, and that meets daily, Monday to Friday. 
the Daily Angus Care Home Huddle Group that's, that's supported by Dr Clement and many of the managers that are on the call today is doing an immense amount of work and I'd like to hand over to Dr Clement to talk you through that. Prior to that, I would also like to commend Ivan Cornford from the independent care, care sector and as the rep there because he's also instrumental in participating in that group and a co-author of the report today so it's a shame he's put his apologies in so I'd like to thank him personally for his support by way of the minutes as well Karen. Yeah. And Dr Clement there I can't see her on the screen. I am here Gail yes. Yes, yeah, so COVID-19 has been a really difficult time for many of us, but especially for those that are involved with care homes, the residents, the families, the staff. And our uh, response has focused on both on preventing COVID outbreaks where at all possible, but also on supporting uh, people where COVID has occurred. And as Gail has said, we've got a multi-professional approach to that. And it's very much built on the good relationships that have been built with the independent sector over many years. So a lot of the support has been around the practicalities of testing and PPE. But moving forwards, we're also supporting how we look in the future to new ways of working, making the most of that multi-professional approach that we've had. And as COVID recedes, recedes ensuring that we're making um, the best uh, opportunity of the opportunities to improve the clinical care for people in care homes and within our wider uh, care at home sector as well and for all our frail elderly. So COVID-19 has been challenging and very, very sad at times. Uh, however, I'm confident that we've got the integrated approach that we need to move um, forward over the next few weeks, months and years. And uh, I would also like to thank Vivian there who does a sterling job on a daily basis um, to support the care homes with good communication. So um, moving forward, we've got a variety of things that we would like to take forward with care homes, but that will very much be done with them and not to them. And that is really building on um, the multidiscipl multidisciplinary approach that we've had so far. Uh, so I'd like to thank everybody for um, taking part in that. It is really good uh, when, things, when things are hard that we all work together. So thank you. Thank you, Alison. I'm just going to, do we have any questions or comments? I'm just going to go around. I, I did see a hand there. I need to flick back now because I just caught it. It's Hugh. Hugh. Yeah, th thanks, Chair. Uh, I, I really welcome this report. Um, it, it's a, a, a very good report, giving a good insight into the work that's being done uh, in the care home side. And I think it's good that we've got a separate report dealing with care homes rather than being subsumed into a wider COVID report um, and I think it, it really does highlight the good approach we've got to joint working uh, within Angus and I'm glad to see that Ivan is a, a co-author <laughs> of the report, it's really good to see. I think particularly given some of the, the narrative that we've got at a national level on the issues surrounding care homes. But I do have two, two questions, um, one relates to the RAG status, it says that homes are categorised into uh, red, amber or green. And I'm just wondering, um, and I, I realise that I guess the numbers will be constantly changing, but if we can get some idea of the numbers against each, each uh, of the three um, criteria. And my second question is, in, uh, is regarding the, the government's commitment to, to testing in care homes. Uh, and I'm just wondering if we can get a, a progress report and to what extent we're achieving. Um, was it every seven days testing within care homes? Yeah. So firstly, with the RAG status, um, that is built on three different uh, types and um, ways of assuring what the RAG status should be. So the Care Inspectorate have criteria, Health Protection Team have criteria, and within the partnership, we're looking at the feedback we get. And I think it's quite useful to look at the, the different sources that are telling you slightly different things, because sometimes we pick up different issues, and that is useful in terms of getting a students. At any one time, it's usually around two or three care homes. So if a care home is an outbreak or a staff's raising, the staff side may be raising concerns or the home themselves are raising concerns about access to PPE or something's been picked up in the assurance report, then we might be moving things to amber and very rarely red, to be honest. But most of the time at the moment, we're bringing things much um, 
closer to green for most of the most of the homes most of the time and we don't haven't had any new confirmed positives in care homes or staff for some time so that's useful veil shaking her head so i'm thinking there's going to be something else she goes. but certainly we're having um um we're having a daily um, look at, at all the, these different areas of data and that's informing what a RAG status is and then there's a discussion that takes place with the partnership in health protection before the weekly reporting into the Scottish Government. Regarding... Um, so sorry Alice, just before you move on, do, do you have current numbers then against our ANG? Against the... What the numbers? How, how many care homes are in red status? How many are in amber? Well, many are in green? I, I can look at it in about two minutes. I've got it on my screen. I just would have to go and refer to. We have definitely got none in definitely none in red, and I think we had one in amber, Vivian. I don't know if that one home is still in amber. Oh, four, Vivian, saying in amber, um, but we have none in red, Hugh. Right. Okay. Thank you. What, what I would like to also say is there was a programme of supportive assurance visits undertaken where a, a senior nurse and a senior social work um, lead visited all the care homes across Angus over a three week period. And they're currently looking at the lessons learned and the next stage of that. Now that was done as a very supportive piece of work and it was actually welcomed by the care homes locally and it's been a very supportive process which i think we're very fortunate with the work that we're doing in angus i don't know vivian who's who's got closer daily contact with the homes um, than me wants to add anything to that but uh, yes yeah yeah the the care homes have really responded very well to the visits by uh, the senior nurse and the se senior uh, care manager um we, you know, they've, they've all been fairly positive. We've uh, worked together with the care homes to identify any further improvements that they can do uh, in um, terms of addressing social distancing issues for staff. That was one of the, the areas um, that is picked up. Um, improvements continue around PPE. Um, and all care homes now, all the staff are wearing PPE all the time appropriately. Uh, and the biggest thing really coming out of the visits is how do we prepare for uh, visitors uh, from families? The plan, my understanding is the plan that they're proposing to look at, I don't think the government's made a final decision, but they're looking at one visitor per, per person taking place outside in the gardens or outside the care home in the gardens. That certainly was a proposal that they were looking at. I don't think there's been any agreement on that today. No, not yet. No. I, should, I should add that all the care homes now are set up for weekly surveillance testing uh, with the, the last care home to start that will be next Tuesday, uh, but they're all, all taking part in the surveillance testing. Yes. Right, thanks for that, Vivian. I think one of the things about the assurance visits that has benefited is that we've got the local nurse and the local care manager attached to homes so that they've got the relationship there and if there's any follow-up actions required that for example anticipated care planning uh, support or, or a need about education about infection control that they've got the local team around you to support that and that's a similar thing for the testing it has been quite a lot to ask of our care homes to um, for the self-testing and staff, there's been a lot of anxiety there, completely understandable with what is a clinical test that we're asking them to carry out. However, that support that's been given at a local level has really um, supported things. And there has, has been hiccups along the way with um, you know, the batches of swabs that were issued to many of our care homes that were faulty and had to be returned. So these things have taken a while to uh, get up and running. Uh, the administrative burden has not insignificant on care homes, but we are working with that local support to provide a lot of reassurance by our nurses at local level. Um, and um, as Vivian says, I think Tuesday's the last one, but there is a lot of the care homes already have got um, done some of the surveillance testing and it should all be in uh, place by next week. Okay, thank you, Alison.
Thank you, everyone. Is there anybody else? Julie? Thank you. It was actually about the testing. Um, I appreciate uh, how complex that's, that's been for everyone. Um, what's the process for the return of those tests? Where do they go? Or do they stay within NHS Tayside? Are they outsourced? And are we getting the results back in, in time for the information within them to be used effectively? So the care homes um, register on a national portal. The tests are then delivered to the care home. The care home then arrange for a day for the test to be collected. We have to have that day known about so that we, because the tests don't survive for long after you've taken the test. So once the care home have the swabs, they organise that testing day for collection, and then they'll do the test and it'll be collected on that the day arranged, and then they should hear back the result uh, quickly. Most of the care homes appear to be getting the results within uh, 20, uh, four, uh, 24 to 36 hours. Thanks, Vivian. And those results appear on the social care portal, so the manager has to go back into the portal to access the test results. Okay, thanks, Vivian. Just looking around, anybody else that would like to come in with anything? Chair yeah, Peter Burke. Peter, okay. Yeah, um, I'm just questioning the, um, the background comment where it says this includes three residential care homes and a learning disability care home operated uh, operationally managed by the Angus Health and Social Care Partnership. Does that include, does this report include um, residential accommodation for people with learning disabilities where the, um, the, the resourcing is provided by an independent provider? No, this is all uh, about the care homes themselves. We have c considered the implications for um, supported <laughs> accommodation as well, though, within the huddle. And um, George wants to say a bit more, but we, some of what the work that we're doing applies. And certainly if people develop symptoms of COVID or the staff looking after people develop symptoms of COVID, we're promoting the same early testing that we do for all our services and people can get tested quickly on a timely basis if they develop symptoms. Okay, okay thank you. George? Yeah, yeah Peter, it, it, uh, it, it's just care homes, it's just facilities that are registered as care homes. It does include St Vigions and the Gables. Right. Okay, Is, are you okay with those answers, Peter, or do you have any follow-up questions? No, it's just that there are places like Ducots, um, which don't seem to be included. Lois, I think Linda Kennedy's on the line. I think she's okay. going to come in. Yeah. Yep. Okay, thank you, Linda. Do you want to come in and answer Peter's questions or queries? So, Peter, um, we have arranged the joint health and social care visit to um, places like Ducat Park. They won't be participating in the testing, but we did re recognise that these supportive visits um, would be useful for those, those projects. Okay, but is there a plan to include them in the testing or not? No, the, the testing is only required by the Scottish Government for registered care homes, Peter. Okay. So, yeah. okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, again, just bear with me. I just want to make sure that I'm not missing anyone out. I can't see any more hands up. Um, and I guess, again, just to, to sum up, um, just... Yeah, I'm glad, like has been said around the room, that this is a separate report. Uh, and again, just uh, thoughts with just the, the huge amount of work that's been undertaken, the, the, the often the distress and heartache at times, uh, especially for those families and staff most directly affected. And um, I think, like like has been said, that, you know, there has been lots of great partnership work and been going on as well. Um, and, you know, we're not quite there yet, but I think it can only stand us in good stead as we move through recovery so um thanks everyone for that and i guess just our recommendation here is to note the current position do we all agree yeah yeah thank you uh, lois uh, i'm just going to quickly change room my kitchen has become busier with the return of some family members well <laughs> i did notice i was i was looking in the cereal cupboard there to see what was <laughs> what was on offer but yeah it's <laughs> like cereal at all times of the day <laughs> okay no worries george okay thank you um, 
Do we want to maybe just uh, pause for a few seconds to, to, till George comes back in? Um, if anyone wants to very quickly nip and do anything, then please do. Um, and we'll just wait before we move on, if that's okay. Chair Elaine Henry's looking to... to okay, speak. Elaine. She needs to unmute, though. It was just to say, I suppose it's, it's been a very fast moving landscape, but we're, we're the, this is probably the forum where the new advice will come in about the extended use of face masks within care homes as well. So I think you know, we assume we, ad we adapt to one thing with, with, with the testing, but this is again going to be a further challenge about, about wearing face masks and just understanding exactly what the guidance means. Um, and, and probably echoing your, your comments about sometimes when it's very difficult for people to understand why they're repeatedly having swabs taken and and again about wearing a face mask so just the I think some, some confidence that the, the the Angus team will work in a very holistic way to introduce that we've just had a meeting um, just before I came here again about about staff testing and just trying to understand what it all means as we work towards the, the introduction next week okay yep thank you Elaine just to come back on that, Elaine, we did pick up quite a lot of anxiety in some of our service users, particularly those with learning disabilities, about the use of the face masks. And that was picked up in an assurance visit. We were able to introduce approaches such as, I can't remember the name of it, but it's, it helps people adapt to having face masks. It's, I think it's something about telling stories, you know, mm -hmm. narratives oh, for people. Yeah. And that's yeah. been very successful. So we are you know, working on these sort of more innovative approaches to help them. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think you're right there. I think there is going to be, you know, there is a huge amount of fear within our communities um, around, you know, that next bit and moving on or, or accessing a service or reaching out. Um, and I guess people will be sometimes, or I know certainly I have at times been weighing up that kind of you're struggling, but actually the fear of doing anything about it because it will have a consequence which will open up to, to, you know to maybe somebody coming in to help so I think you're right I think it is about helping people through those different um, processes and, and supports that's there or like you say face masks I'm just looking to see is, 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 is there any shortage of PPE or face mask or is there an adequate supply at the moment adequate supply Bob at the moment thank you okay I've just noticed that I think George is George is back in. Is that right, Karen? Um, I haven't. I've seen. I see his name, but he's not on video he's, yet. Karen, can I check if Kate Bell has been able to join us yet? Yeah, Kate because Bell's the next, been in from the beginning. Yeah. yeah. Oh, right. Kate the there. Next, yeah. The next item um, will involve Kate. So that's yeah. fine. Just checking. Okay. So I think yep, yeah, you're back, George, but we can't see you. Um, Hopefully you're quite happy that we just go on to agenda item number six of everybody's. Hopefully that's been a little bit of a comfort break and we can, can move on to agenda item number six, which is our mental health update. Um, and I will pass you over to Gail. Um, yeah. Or so is it Gail, are you going yes. out? Or, or yes, I'll just, I'll just introduce that. Um, apologies, firstly, because I've still noted that we've got a verbal update to be provided. Uh -huh. Um, the plan, obviously, um, is, as we're aware, we had a previous verbal update that I shared with you all at the previous meeting on the 22nd of April. Since then, Kate Bell has been formally appointed as the Interim Director for Mental Health for NHS Dayside. And since then, a number of things have taken place. One in particular was a stakeholder engagement event, which was held on the 28th of May which a number of people today from the IGB were in attendance of. That was really for us to gain further understanding of the progress that was being made with the draft action plan that required to be submitted on the 1st of June in response to the Trust and Respect Independent Inquiry Report. So I think from, from my perspective, I would rather hand over to Kate at this stage, Chair, Okay, thank you. Welcome, Kate. Thanks very much for joining us today. Um, I'll just I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Okay, Dear Sonny, can I interrupt? I'll just get you back to relax there, Gail, because I thought you were just going to go through it all for me. Um, <laughs> no such luck. No such luck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for sorry, that. Um, just but sorry, Kate, just before you start, I think maybe Karen just was there. Is there a technical issue, Karen? Yeah, sorry, Kate. Sorry to interrupt, um, Chair and everybody else. 
just to let you know, there was an amended um, appendix to the report that was sent out about half past one today. There was a couple of lines that had fallen off the bottom of the appendix, so it's just hopefully now you've got the actual amended version to make it easier for you to read. Okay, thank you, Karen. Thanks, Kate. And yeah, sorry, Kate, to interrupt, but yeah, on you go, off you go. That's again. okay. Thank, thank you. you. Um, I, I welcome the opportunity to you know address the IJB and, and Angus. So thank you for that. So the purpose of, of the report today is, is one to introduce myself. Um, as Gail has said, that um, I came to Tayside on the 2nd of March um, as the Director of the Mental Health and Wellbeing Strategy um, and soon after arrived and took responsibility for the independent inquiry response. And as of the 6th of April, um, I've been appointed as the Interim Director of Mental Health. So who knows what appointment's coming next? Um, so it's, it's really um, great to, to be with you today. So by way of introduction, also in terms of the engagement and communication um, that we would like to set out with, you know, from the start, but this is about an equal sharing of information, an equal opportunity to feedback and to engage in that process. So I know some of you, but not all of you, um, and I hope to be able to meet you face to face at, at some point in the future. So the report that I provided you with um, really provides an update from February 20 to June 2020. So a wee bit of a look back and a wee bit of, a, um, of an update. So you'll be aware that the Independent Inquiry Report um, was published on I think it was the 6th of February um, 2020. At the NHS board on the 27th, some of you who are members of that, um, signed up to and accepted the recommendations um, from Trust and Respect. I then began to work with a variety of people at that point as a dedicated resource to look at how we can respond to Trust and Respect. And at that time, the Scottish Government had asked for a very detailed um, action plan from across Tayside um, on how we would respond to those 51 recommendations and what actions we would put in place. Um, after speaking to local authority chief executives, to the chief officers and to a whole range of people, um, it became quite clear that people were working, as you've said in your meeting today, tirelessly, exclusively um, around the COVID-19 pandemic. So it was um, best for us to speak to the Scottish Government to adjust those time frames um, in relation to what our milestones would be around our response to trust and respect. And that's entirely around getting um, proper engagement and proper contributions you know, to the final draft action plan um, as we go forward um, and to allow these kinds of conversations to take place. So the draft action plan um, was submitted to the Scottish Government on the 1st of June very much in draft form um, and I've agreed to work with um, a range of, I think we have up to 200 um, stakeholders who've been engaged again in this kind of second tranche of communication and engagement around the action plan with an intention of again having another milestone at the end of June to see how well we've done with that engagement. Um, as all of you will be aware, um, you know, engagement at this time and getting people's capacity is, is unpredictable. Um, so we'll continue to work with people on that. If, as Gail has said, we had a, um, an NHS board um, development session, which was converted into a stakeholder engagement session in recognition of some of those challenges around um, engagement. So we were able to bring on board the stakeholder participation group, the employee participation group, and Scottish Government and some others um, onto that session. So through those kinds of mechanisms, we've been able to build up a much more detailed, comprehensive look at those 51 recommendations and actually start to work on some of those already as people become um, less exclusively involved in maybe some capacities being released within the system around COVID-19. So I guess in terms of um, where we're at, the report that you have here in front of you um, gives you that clear indication. You've got a copy of the draft action plan that went to the government on the 1st of June. Happy to get into you know, conversation with you and any questions that you may have um, around that. I just think to give you maybe a, a bit of an update in terms of what we have in place um, at the minute. So you'll, you'll, the, the IJB will be aware of the um, Tayside Executive Partners, which is the membership of a Tayside White Group local authority chief executives, NHS chief, chief executives, input from the Police Scotland chief superintendent, um, and also the chief officers for each of the health and social care partnerships and integration joint boards. Um, and I operate with that group 
um, as an overall governance group in relation to the response to trust and respect. But not only the response to trust and respect, we're now looking at a Tayside wide mental health and wellbeing strategy um, and a Tayside wide change programme, which will take on board all of the recommendations from trust and respect. But we'll also look in terms of recommendation three, I think it is, um, whole systems redesign of mental health services supports um, and services across Tayside. And that's not just public sector organisations, that's third sector organisations. So therefore, including quite closely um, the relationship with people with lived experience, with carers, with families, um, and across the population. So that's a Tayside wide, population wide, lifespan approach to a mental health and wellbeing strategy. Um, and I guess to go back to you know the um, beginning of this, the, I suppose I was invited to come to TSA to do something that I already did in another health board area successfully, um, is look at that you know population wide mental health and wellbeing. Um, and again, we're looking to replicate that in TSA as a framework, but to tailor it to a TSA wide approach. So I guess in terms of some of the good things that have happened so far, we do have a TSA wide mental health and wellbeing strategy board which I think on our first meeting on the 19th of, um, I think it was the 19th of May, we had 33 people on a call just like this. So Chair, I appreciate the, the demands of, of trying to chair um, such a difficult meeting with so many people on screen. Uh, we also have a, a, a range of scoping sessions which are taking place around that mental health and wellbeing strategy. Um, and I think we have had 206 people engaged in that process so far. So just to give you an indication, that's looking at things like good mental health for all across the sites. How do we engage in that inequalities agenda? How do we look at housing? How do we look at employment? What are, what are the relationships to, to mental health for substance misuse? So it gives you the, the scope of, of work that we're trying to do to take on board all aspects of mental health and also where it has an association with the impact on lifestyle and life circumstances for people. Um, again, in terms of Communication engagement. We have a frequent, you know, um, fortnight call with the Scottish Government again to feedback on, on progress being made um, in Tayside. Again, the importance of partnership has not been forgotten in all of this in terms of staff side. So we have we're building up from my new role in terms of the interim director of mental health. What our partnership arrangements need to be around um, mental health. So given that mental health. Functions are delegated to some of the integration joint boards. We welcome the discussion in terms of how we put that mental health partnership forum approach together um, with Gail and, um, and probably others on this call as well. So we will obviously continue to work with you. Uh, one of the things to finish with is that um, it's been really fantastic, I think, and I'm not sure if this is common practice across TSA, but since I've arrived, we've had excellent work across all of the mental health functions from COVID-19 point of view, um, through the command process that's been put in place, all of the functions and you know thanks very much to, to Bill and colleagues um, who participated in that and made that easy you know for all of us to work together. We have a mental health silver command which again um, I sit on as the interim director and again it's, it's just been um, fantastic in terms of some of the practice that we've been able to put together to ensure that those people with mental health conditions receive the best possible care and support that they can within the community during this difficult time. Uh, I guess in terms of the, the remainder of the report, the recommendation for the report um, is to, to you know, support the, the process so far and, um, and recognise the progress that's been made. So I'll stop there, Chair, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions in relation to the, the detail that's in the Listen and Learn Change Action Plan. OK, thank, thank you, you very much, Kate. Thank you for that. Um, what a time to, to take up a position, eh? So, yeah, thanks for explaining, I guess, just all what you've been up to and what the plans are moving forward in terms of mental health. Um, I'm just going to look around the room now and uh, see if I can see any hands. Karen will probably be quicker. Councillor Miles, the... then Councillor Bell have raised a blue hand. OK, Councillor Miles, thanks. Yes. Uh... Thank, thank you, Camilla, and uh, welcome, Kate, to Tayside. It's, uh, we're very glad to have you here, and I wish you all success in your new position. Uh, a couple of things, uh, questions I have on your plan. I didn't pick up any uh, reference to psychiatry of old age. Is that included in the mental health uh, plan? 
I noticed that there was reference to uh, lack of uh, recruitment of psychiatrists, but no mention of psychiatry old age. And I'll give you a second question, uh, and that's uh, closer to home. The Mulberry in Sakatha was used very successfully, uh, you're probably aware, in the past. Does it figure at all in any future uh, delivery of uh, care? Inside? So um, I can answer both of those questions at a high level, I guess. Um, in terms of psychiatry of old age, it, it is a mental health service. Um, it is devolved across each of the health and social care partnerships. Going forward, I would like to see a, con a consolidation of working across mental health. So therefore, those staff who work in the psychiatry of old age, they have a, um, a blend of responsibilities, I guess, in terms of the mental health conditions that, that people may have. But given the age of people, they also report, in that, I guess, to medicine within an acute division and also to old age. Um, I think you have an old age, um, is it a partnership board or a, or a program board? So they feel as if there's maybe a bit of a split there for their responsibilities. But as the interim director of mental health, I would absolutely see them sitting within mental health um, as a delegated function within the Health and Social Care Partnership. And I would look forward to working with them as mental health staff. Um, in that um, in that way. I'm happy to have that dialogue going forward. Um, I'd like to be as inclusive as we possibly can. Um, so across Scotland, you know, psychiatry old age would be seen as a mental health service. In relation to the Mulberry unit, um, I guess this is a bit of a, an, issue, an issue in terms of the redesign of services going forward. Um, I know that Bill has been heavily involved in, in some of that and maybe invite Bill, Bill to see if he, in, you know, in terms of the history of this, being in post for the last 10 weeks, um, I'm just picking up on some of these issues. From the action plan point of view, it's very clear that a whole system redesign would have to take on board all services you know, in relation to mental health and learning disabilities. What I didn't go into in detail in terms of the response in um, the paper is that you'll be aware that the Mental Health Minister made a statement in Parliament, I think it was the 11th of March, around NHS Tayside being responsible for general adult psychiatry inpatient services, which includes a range of um, smaller services within that responsibility. So there is movement and there will be movement in mental health um, services across Tayside as we go forward. Working in recommendations is a lot of work um, and I think that in NHS uh, mental health services and what the mental health functions within each of the health and social care partnerships will look extremely different um, as we go forward. But we absolutely want to do that and must do that in partnership. Okay, thank you. No, just, we, we had plans for doing something with the Mulberry unit, uh, but if it was going to figure again in the mental health delivery, uh, you know, that would put that on hold. I think Bill has an answer for you on that. I mean, if you would just like me to, to give a view on, on Mulberry. So myself and George Bowie are both on the mental health and well-being strategic board, George representing learning disabilities and myself and mental health. So certainly my view regarding um, acute admission beds, um, the view that I would be give, given was that, you know, Mulberry transferred out of Strickanthro back in 2017 for a variety of reasons around patient safety. We were unable to um, provide a safe environment for patients in what was a standalone acute mental health unit. Um, some of that was to do with 24-hour medical cover, but it wasn't solely to do with medical cover. Um, those factors haven't changed, so at the moment um, I, wouldn't, I don't see any strategic direction to bring acute mental health beds back to Angus. Instead, we need to continue to work with our colleagues in the Carthew Centre to provide a, an excellent experience for people in Angus. And that's part of the work stream about improving access into Carthew. But also just to reassure the board, and I've said this before, that a lot of the Mulberry staff now have transferred into our community services and, and we continue to develop our community services. And we've still got the view, and you'll see that in the action plan, to deliver a seven-day community service in Angus. So we're using the staff who worked in Mulberry, we're using their expertise now to develop the community services. Thank you, Bill. Okay, is that you, Councillor Miles? Yeah. Yes. Can I Thank you. Can I come in? Can I come in, Chair? Yeah. So just to be to be clear for Councillor Miles, um, psychiatry old age service is a delegated function to the health and social care partnerships. It's not a hosted function. 
it's delegated, so it will remain within the responsibility of the health and social care partnerships. Okay, okay. thanks, Gail, okay. for that clarity. Um, I think, was it Councillor, Councillor Bell, Julie, are you? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, welcome, Kate, um, to Tayside, and just for clarity, no relation. Uh, <laughs> no conflict of interest there, Julie, no. <laughs> no, absolutely none. Um, I, I just wanted to find out a bit more about the approach around um, the learning disabilities element of, of this. Um, it didn't seem clear to me, and when you were talking, the audio was cutting in and out a bit, so apologies if I've missed it. But I'm, I'm thinking primarily about our community-based services, but also about the acute inpatient learning disability resource. Okay, um, so again, as Gail has said, that there are remains, you know, delegated functions within um, the health and social care partnerships. So you do have learning disability community functions. There is a learning disability inpatient function, which would come to the NHS Tayside as part of the mental health and learning disability general adult psychiatry inpatient services. So the LD inpatient services will now be managed by NHS Tayside. Thanks, Kate. Julie, do you have any other follow-up questions? No, not, not at the moment, but if, if okay. I do, I can... I'll look out for your hands, maybe going up before we, before we close. Um, I did notice um, Andy, Andrew Jack. No, no, I was fiddling with oh, the, okay. the, the volume button. Sorry about that. That's okay. I thought you were waving frantically at me because I was missing no, no, you. No, I was, I was trying to get the sound down a bit, okay. a bit loud. Okay, I've, the next hand I noticed waving, uh, and I'm not sure if you're first in the queue or not, but Alison Clement, please. Okay. I, thank you, and sorry I've missed part of that presentation. I had a problem with my internet connection. But what I would wish to highlight is the uh, importance of primary care being involved with the work around mental health. Most contacts with mental health occur in general practice, we've developed good integrated teams around the person, whether it's psychiatry of old age, integrating with our medicine for the elderly, or our mental health and wellbeing services in general practice. And I just want to highlight that uh, although these services, we need to look at the, the, the professional governance, perhaps at NHS Tayside wide, it is incredibly important that we as a partnership continue to look at how we work in an integrated way across all, ser all the services that people experience so that the care that people experience is centred around them and not around any service, however that's distributed. Very much in uh, recognising the value of uh, professional leadership in into a service as well though. Okay, thank you, Alison. Can I just say, I, mean, I didn't detect a question there, Alison, it's lovely to meet you. Um, but from a, a, a mental health and well-being point of view, we have to be person-centred. Um, it's about putting the person at the centre of everything that we do. So we would want to work in partnership with not just the organisational infrastructures, but the other services. Um, where we talk about you know, addiction services and mental health, primary care, general practice. Um, I'm doing a presentation to the, um, the, the GP sub on Monday night, you know, um, to start to engage the um, GPs on that. And we have done you know, presentations in the past. And in my previous job, um, I directed the um, primary care transformation piece, you know, which reported into the government. So I'm very much aware of the GMS contract, very much aware of your, your primary care improvement plans, um, and would want to augment that in relation to building that community capacity for you know, specialist services from a mental health perspective. Um, I'm aware of the, the, the National Scottish um, strategy of those commitments in terms of Action 15 in particular um, around building that, that specialist capacity within mental health and also aware of the fact that 94% of that activity happens in the community. So we'd be keen to work with people because this is a whole systems response and what we we'll absolutely want to do from a mental health perspective is to make mental health easier to talk about, to, to push services upstream, to work more with our NHS colleagues, um, NHS 24. I know that general practice use NHS 24 111 for a lot of triage, um, and the population are very comfortable with that. So we don't want to over pathologize mental health, um, and very much aware that we're adjusting our thinking around COVID 19. 
in relation to the impact and the distress that, that some people in the population may feel who have never experienced mental health um, you know, pressures before. So again, in terms of our terminology, it's important that we don't um, suggest that people have mental health conditions as a result of COVID-19. Um, I think we've all felt, and I think, Chair, you said yourself, that there have been pressures you know, for all of us in our daytime, in our daily living, as well as with our families. Um, so what kind of supportive infrastructures can we all work on to put together in relation to that tiered approach um, around the, the community? So we really look forward to working with community teams in, in general practice and our third sector organisations, not to forget the, the vast contribution that, that they make to this um, in relation to that. So both systems um, we will work on, on mental health and wellbeing. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Kate. Um, I did notice, I think it was Elaine, your hand up. But you'll need to unmute. There we go. There we go. Uh, I, I, thank you. It was, it was just to, to echo Kate's point, and it is that, as we, from, from, from Alison as well, that we need to, to integrate across the three partnerships and to integrate with physical health and to integrate with, with inpatient mental health as well. And that is the, the strength of the Tayside system, is that whole system approach. We've seen it again from our winter planning, our COVID response, our, our coming out of COVID. It's all been a kind of whole system approach. And I think that that, that goes for mental health as well. Um, and that allows us just to design the services for, for individuals, no matter where they are, um, that, that, that we all kind of work together. Just to, to, to echo that, that, that that's what's worked so well. And, and it's, it's just natural to keep doing it for this too. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you, Elaine. Thanks, Elaine. Again, I am just, if you bear with me a few seconds while I try and seek out anybody that uh, has a hand up. I don't know, Karen, if you're getting to anybody no, quicker. I can't see anybody else, no. Mm, can't see anyone. Julie's waving. Julie. 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 Okay, Julie. Yeah, no, it was, it was just a, a wee follow-up to Kate around <laughs> the learning disabilities question for clarity uh, around the community-based services if they're if they're devolved to the IGB do you, is that to the person can Ross IGB as a hosted service or will that be devolved to the Angus IGB? I think it is already devolved to each of the health and social care partnerships so there is an equal distribution um, in terms of the so joint. okay so it'll stay that way Yes, so uh, you know, going forward, there's obviously a, a review of the integration schemes to have, and that's not just mental health, that's across you know, all of the delegated responsibilities. That's something that's required within a five year period of the, uh, of the schemes being initiated. So I think we're, we're in that process this year. You'll have seen within the Listen, uh, Learn, Change Action Plan that a request has been to review those um, integration schemes from, from a mental health perspective. So I've asked Bill Nicholl, who worked with, I'm sure, um, the people who were around at that time, to initiate that process for the three health and social care partnerships. Mm -hmm. So again, in terms of moving forward, we've got an opportunity to relook at those, to look at what's worked, what can be improved, what, what we want to achieve going forward. Um, and in relation to that Tayside-wide approach, is there services that we can consolidate that would help Tayside as a, an area, as a geographical area, I'm sure you're all aware that when services are consolidated, we're able to recruit and retain staff you know, differently. If we've got an attraction around the centre of excellence for any aspect of any of our services, we've been able to showcase that service differently um, out with Tayside and therefore attract people to come and work in Tayside. You'll be well versed in the, the workforce deficits that are around you know, within mental health. One of the key things that I'm um, looking to do, and uh, Elaine, um, Henry, Mike Winter, and some of the other people from the Health and Social Care Partnerships are, are willing to support this, is to look at a recruitment and retention plan for Tayside, to say on the back of our mental health and wellbeing strategy, shaping services differently, ambitiously looking forward, how can we start to um, recruit and retain you know, people within Tayside to add to the, um, the fantastic staff group that are here just now. Okay, thank you again, Kate, for that very detailed uh, answer. Again, just before we close on this agenda item, I just want to make sure there is no last minute hands up. Um, I see Hugh's hand oh, up there. Hugh, I'll go for Catherine then. Hugh, if that's okay, Catherine, thank you. 
Thank you. Um, Kate, hopefully quite a quick and straightforward question. I just wondered if you could provide a little more detail around the thinking um, on page 70 of the combined document, so the very last page of your document where you're referring to advocacy services. So I'm aware that that's one of the work streams um, and I, I just wondered if you could um, share a little bit of the thinking around what's going on with that because I, I noticed there are a number of services that I commission that are, are noted there. Um, but also the um, interesting comment about uh, Bruce Adamson who has an incredible reputation. I'm sure you'll be very pleased to know that we've published that in Angus. So I guess, I guess for me, um, I don't have access to the document that you have in front of you, but if it's the Listen, Learn, Change Action Plan around advocacy services, there are a number of functions for advocacy services to play within mental health services, not least within our child and adolescent mental health services, around how we have advocacy services involved here, whether it's to advocate on behalf of the family or on behalf of the child, um, in terms of whether they're looked after and accommodated or whether it's a child with, with women and um, disabilities. So those advocacy services look differently, you know, um, across all of mental health. But I guess with the point that's being made in trust and respect is that we need to give equal room to advocacy in relation to our decision making. So I'm um, happy to meet you, Catherine, and happy to, to meet you on today to look at how we implement some of those recommendations if you have a contribution to make differently from what's already there in terms of the actions, as someone with a subject matter expertise background in that, I would really welcome that. It's certainly just to just to point out, Kate, I guess that those services are not commissioned necessarily with purely a mental health service role. Um, and so it's really important that connectedness that you've talked to other work streams, particularly the integrated children's services work that's also panty site, uh, but with a local flavour. So it's just to not to miss those connections. I think, Chair, if I can just make the point that um, although I've been appointed to the interim director of mental health within NHS Tayside, the mental health and wellbeing strategy is Tayside wide and therefore has no agency brand other than it's about mental health of the population. So in terms of listen, learn, change action plan, although that was something that came from NHS Tayside, it was absolutely signed up by the Tayside Executive um, Partners. So Margot um, would have sat on that group and you know, I've met Margot on a number of occasions with Gail you know, to talk about what that system-wide you know, approach to mental health looks like. So I would want to encourage people to think about all services. This is not an NHS-driven process. This is about Tayside-wide um, processes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Catherine, and thank you, Kate. And Hugh, would you like yeah, to thank, comment? Yeah. Thank, yeah, it's just a wee niggle at the back of my mind about the Mulberry and the comment that uh, Bob made about putting on hold what we're doing. I mean, we, we've got clear plans for moving services into the Mulberry, and if it hadn't been for issues around changing uh, the, the building spec, we'd have been in already. Uh, and I hear what Bill says, looking at it from, from whether or not there's a need. But I, I'm really looking for a, for a commitment from Gail that we're, we're going to carry on doing what we're doing with regard to moving services into the Mulberry and we're not putting it on hold. Hugh, Hugh you're absolutely right. It's been very frustrating for us, as, as you're aware. Um, and we've, we've been asked not to move forward with that until definitive decisions are taking place. All by we need to consider our next stage of our strategic plan and the need here but i think it would be very helpful to put the situation to bed so everybody is clear particularly the northeast population but also others who keep asking the question so i don't know if there's any possibility of being able to do that now that kate submitted the draft report to the government but, but as, part, as part of our angus care model we, we, we yep we, we made a clear decision uh, about the use of the mulberry, what we, what we wanted yep. it for. Yep. I, I'm disappointed that that's been put on hold. So I guess on the back of that, Hugh, it, it would be helpful to, to understand that the service redesign that predates you know, um, the independent inquiry, I think that, that was halted, I don't know if I could use that word, um, by the, the author of Trust and Respect in terms of on the back of wanting to see a Tayside-wide strategy for mental health. 
that there was, you know, some resistance to putting that separate redesign in place because potentially it didn't represent the evidence base or it didn't represent a population approach to, to mental health services. I have to say, since coming into post and having looked at that, um, one of the key things for me in my conversations with the chief executive here um, and with the Scottish Government is to take early action to rapidly review that redesign process to ensure that we can move forward to put those outstanding you know, moves in place. Um, and I guess you know, it's maybe what's behind you know, what, um, some of the questions are around you know, learning disabilities. Because we need to give people stability. We need to give people the best care that we can possibly give them. And we need to be as future oriented as we possibly can be. But sitting with a, a set of services as they are now doesn't allow us to do that. Can you give us a time scale, Kate, for your considerations in the Mulberry? I guess the, the considerations for Mulberry would be for yourselves. Um, I guess in terms of the overall service review um, of um, general adult psychiatry inpatient services, which will impact potentially or could have in the past impacted. Um, what I hear from colleagues who, who work in Angus is that the situation um, that you've got in Mulberry is interdependent with our service redesign. And um, so therefore I'm offering to try and get an early action on that um, in communication with the chief executive here. Um, to look at what are, are there any barriers for starting to put that in place. I've got uh, um, support from the Scottish Government and the author of Trust and Respect has also said that that would be a, um, a good early action to put in place. So the future is, is really within our hands. So I'm happy to have conversations here um, and feedback to you, but I can't give you a date on that. Here. Okay, thank you. Sure. don't see anybody else's hand up. Um, I guess what I would maybe just like to add, and, and perhaps not so much for yourself, Kate, but just in terms of locally with Angus, um, I guess if I was a service user right now, and you know, we've talked about it being person-centered, so you know, what this uh, journey must, might feel like moving forward might be different to, to different people that require a mental health service or support. Um, and, and so if I was listening in, and you know, so if I was a service user listening in today, I would, I would maybe still be left wondering, what does this actually all mean? Um, and, you know, there has been a, a, a huge emphasis placed on, on listening to those that have been affected um, and to those that receive a service and, and helping them to help us so that we were all in this together to, to shape things as we move forward. What opportunities will there be in Angus for, for people to be involved? Um, it's, it's maybe a question for, for Bill. Yeah, that's the forefront of my, my mind, um, Lois. So I've um, briefed this board before about the Angus Mental Health Network, mm -hmm. um, which is representative for users, carers, uh, albeit from a mental health point of view, not a learned discipline point of view, but it's all ages, so it's, it's CAMS, it's older people as well. So we will certainly have, that, that network, sorry, will certainly have large part to play an engagement um, with this strategy. Angus Voice have a voice on the new Mental Health and Wellbeing Board. Mm -hmm. I know that they, that's the very formal structures. We also, we will work with, with Kate and the team to look at other ways that we could have a more informal approach. So similar to how we had continuing the conversations in Angus, which I think was a, was, went very well. We engaged with a lot of people, not just people who would used mental health services. Mm -hmm. um, so I think as well as targeting the traditional people who, use, who we think use mental health services, you know, as I've said before, one in three of the population will have a mental um, health issue sometime in their life. So we need to have these conversations with, with the whole population. Mm -hmm. So it's the two-pronged um, approach that we need to use here. So um, I think the scoping events that, that Kate's mentioned, that's an opportunity for, for lots of different stakeholders um, to take part. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to assure you that, uh, uh, that people in Angus, service users and other stakeholders, will, uh -huh. voices will be heard in this whole process. Yeah, thanks, Bill, because I think that is, that is reassuring and I'm sure that is what the people of Angus want to be hearing is that there is that commitment there that, you know, they will be involved and included. Um, and that there is a real drive to improve the lives of those with uh, mental health and those affected and, and to, to make that change a real one that, that, that does provide a better service and support network. So thank you. 
Um, on that, are we just happy to agree the recommendation, which is to note the content of the report? Read. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone for that. I'm going to just move us now on to <coughs> agenda item number seven. Um, which is a, is a myself chair then sorry. from the remainder of the meeting. Okay, thank you so much, Kate. Thank you very much thank for you. and look forward to meeting you, you um, at some point in the future. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Kate. Thank you. Okay, so agenda item number seven is the Scottish Government guidance on directions from the integration authorities to health boards and local authorities. And I shall hand you over to Gail, please. Um, Chair, I'm just going to hand straight over to David. Okay. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, this report is to advise the board about the statutory guidance which has been issued by the Scottish Government uh, in respect of directions, uh, and which the board are obliged to have a regard to in the exercise of their functions. Um, it's not a very lengthy document, but I think there's some clear issues. There's, there's clear points to it. I think there's an emphasis on the, sta the strategic commissioning role that the, the board has and the, the financial responsibility. It also emphasizes the need for the board to use directions as a means of monitoring outcomes in terms of the delivery of integrated services, and also the need for the board to have as much information as it possible and as it needs to allow it to perform its functions. I think in practice, uh, and I think this has been adopted elsewhere, we're going to include in future a, a short uh, section in each report that gets presented to the board to say, do you need a direction? Or does this report require a direction? Because I think it's clear that there's an expectation that we will be issuing a lot more directions to the health board and the local authority. Um, and, and I think, as I mentioned in the report, this is a this is going to be an evolving process. Uh, we will look at what practice is elsewhere, um, and and we will continue to engage in terms of building up a process whereby directions are built into the board's monitoring functions. We've recently had discussions with Christina Naismith, who is the, the head of integration at the Scottish Government, and she's offered to come up and speak to the board about the the guidance and how it impacts on. The board's functions in their practice um, and I think we're going to try and arrange that around about the, the August meeting and perhaps have a development session and that, I think that'll give a good opportunity for the board members to explore the role of directions in their processes and procedures um, and as I say in conclusion we're, we're, we're simply asking the board to note the statutory guidance and the, the changes that are required to the board's governance arrangements to comply with that guidance. Okay thanks very much David. Um, a very helpful uh, insight there into what's been asked. Um, I'm just going to look around to see if we've got any questions or comments for David. Chair, just a, a Chair, comment. Yeah. Um, David um, has been extremely helpful around the support for the, the Abbey Health Centre paper where it's been crucial that we've had to involve Christina Nee Smith from the integration unit to support us. And I think we very much should take up that opportunity to learn from the team because it is going to be an evolving and developing um, next step. And as the directions are a legal mechanism, I think we need to have clarity around that as a board. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Gail. Councillor Bell. Councillor Bell. Yeah. Just a, a wee reflection. I mean, I think. We've traditionally seen directions as a, a last resort um, and, and we've kind of bent over backwards to avoid using them. Um, yeah. but th this felt to me like it's be going to become a much more integral part of our escalation processes <clears throat> rather, rather than that last resort. Is, is that a fair mm. yeah. analysis? Okay, I think David wants to, you're going to come yeah. back in David, yeah? Mm -hmm. Chair, I, I had always viewed directions as exactly as Councillor Bell had said, that it was a sign that something was failing. Mm -hmm. The Scottish Government have a different view on this and they feel that it's an integral part, not, not of an escalation process, but more of a quality assurance 
And it's about the, the, the IGB telling the health board and the council exactly what it wants it to, de wants it to deliver and for how much. And, and as I say, I think it all kind of ties in to all of the board's constitutional documents to, to make sure that everybody knows what's expected and what's been delivered. So it's not an escalation, it's more a, a quality assurance process. No, that's okay. Yeah. Is that reassuring, Julie? Yes, I, yes. I, I, I think that there have been times when I felt we could have used it more readily. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think this is potentially quite a helpful development. So yeah, it'd be interesting to see how it goes. Okay, thank you. Just a quick look round. No hands. Okay. So th thank you on that. If we just uh, can, I just ask you, board, are you happy to agree the recommendations, which is to note the statutory guidance issued by Scottish Government on directions from the integration authorities on health boards and local authorities, and to note the changes required to the board's governance arrangements to comply with the guidance. Do we agree? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Can I just check in and ask and, and make sure everybody's okay, that we're going at the right pace, that there's everyone fine? Okay, good. Hugh, you're smiling happily there, thank you. Always happy. Good stuff. <laughs> Always look to you just to make sure. Um, that takes us on to agenda item number eight. So it just wouldn't be an IGB and be meeting without a financial finance report. And uh, on that, I shall uh, hand you over to Sandy. Are thank you, you there? Chair. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, so this is a summary report of our, our year end position for the year 2019-20. Um, yeah, to some extent, there's not much new in this report, uh, which is probably, from my perspective, a, a relatively helpful thing. Um, so what that means is the kind of information and projections we've been making throughout the year have largely come to pass. Um, and so, as I say, there's nothing particularly uh, new. One or two, there are one or two things that I would highlight. Um, this report does reference the, the kind of late March impact of COVID-19, particularly regarding prescribing. But we, we also note in the report that some of the effects we saw in March have, have kind of unwound themselves in, in April or May. And we now know that even more clearly than when I wrote the report, that that effect is probably largely neutral overall. Um, in terms of points to note, just a couple of other things. Uh, we have for many years um, uh, reflected on where we are with prescribing. Um, this report confirms that uh, for the last financial year, you know, with one or two wee caveats in there, we were much nearer to break even for prescribing on our budgets than we have ever been before. So that's had a, a really positive effect on the IGB's overall financial position, which obviously helps us do so many other things. Um, and one of those other things is uh, able, being able to utilise the reserves that we've made, uh, created in previous years. and. Um, you can see in one of the appendixes, the final appendix as we, in, in the reserve section, it notes that through things like the strategic planning group, we are managing to now mobilise uh, some of those reserves as we have been for the last half year. Uh, and those are things that are now started to help facilitate uh, the IGB both in the short term, but also to deliver its long term strategic uh, objectives. So that's the main things. Uh, just one final point to note, uh, these accounts are that you're seeing today are a set of management accounts. They're kind of a reflection of the management position as we've been reporting it throughout the whole year. They are slightly different, but in a completely reconcilable way uh, to a set of uh, final financial accounts that were presented to the audit committee uh, today, um, which was a helpful uh, audit committee that uh, Julie and others were attending and, and Julie noted that earlier on. Uh, so that, that uh, audit committee this morning received our uh, unaudited accounts and those accounts will now get passed to our auditors. I think Emma's on the phone, sorry, on the line. They'll get passed to Emma and Rachel um, in the next few days and hopefully come back to the audit committee uh, as final accounts, all being well at the end of August. Okay. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Sandy. Um, just going to look along and see if we've got any questions for you. Any questions or comments? Sandy, I think you're you're getting off light. That that's it. That's you did done this morning. Oh, okay, okay. Oh well, make up for it now, Sandy. Okay, right. And Catherine Lindsay has a hand up. Sorry. Oh, Catherine. Sorry, on you go, Catherine. Thank you, um, Sandy. I just wondered if you could um, explain a, a little bit about the, the physical disabilities um, projection over under page eighty in your appendix one. 
So I'm just conscious that we've got a report coming up um, later in the session around physical disabilities. Can you say a little about what those things mean? Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> Two seconds. I'm just seeing if we've covered it in the report. Anyway, when we got to that report, it's next. So if you want to hold it or want to do it just now. Yeah, there is a brief comment about this in the report, Catherine. It's at section uh, 4.1.5. Um, and what that notes, and it, and it may come up in, I can't remember the exact wording in the next report that George has just referred to, um, the physical disabilities kind of, the, the kind of almost creation of that budget is, is, is a more, sorry, the creation of that budget is a more identifiable and visible budget in our reports. It's always something that we've developed over the last couple of years. Uh, so we've kind of spun it out of um, all the people services to give it a, you know, a, more, a, a higher profile. Uh, but in doing that, we have got a wee bit of budget realignment to continue to do. So that's that's the kind of comment we've um, we've we've noted it 4.1.5. Um, you know, we we are we're still really in the early stages of developing that financial framework for physical disabilities, uh, and it's not allied. Uh, in a, in a, the improvement side of it is allied to what you see in the next report, but it is a relatively recent creation in our overall financial monitoring. It, it, if you looked at a report from two years ago, that wouldn't have been so visible, and, and now we've got it. But we just have to with, with, with kind of just kind of identifying caseloads and things like that it's there's always a wee bit of time to get the right balance of there so that will happen uh, in due course okay any follow-up Catherine or are you that's it is that you okay thank you thanks Sandy um I don't see any more hands up and so on that I would just ask you board do we note the recommendations one to note the overall financial position of Angus IGB for 1920 Note the risks documented in the financial risk assessment. And three, note the update regarding reserves set out in Appendix 3. Do we agree? Agreed. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, on that, we will move on to agenda item number eight. Uh, sorry, agenda item number nine, um, which is the strategy for carers for the fresh report. Um, and I'm going to just uh, hand you over, I think, first to... To George, is that right, Gail? George, can I, looking, can I maybe do you want to George, come in first? Okay. Yes, before George starts, I can't actually see Chair if Jerry Forteeth is is in the meeting yeah. today. But but yes. first, right, is there, Jerry yes. there? Yeah. Okay. So um, prior to handing over to George, there, I would just like to um, thank Jerry actually before George speaks to the report because for those of you that don't know, Jerry is retiring. Um, on Friday, I think is his last working day, but he has provided extensive support, progress and leadership around the implementation of the carer strategy and the carer's work. So I think just on behalf of all of us, I would like to thank Jerry for his input. Despite my efforts to keep him going, he's determined he's going off to wherever, Italy and fishing and everything else. So um, I can't see you, Jerry, but thank you very much for this. I'm sure Vivian, who's taking on um, the leadership role, will do a good job, though. Yeah, Got a good sure starting job. ground. <laughs> Sorry, you. George. Sorry, Thank George. You, no, that's okay. I, um, I will just echo those words. Uh, Jerry will be sorely missed as part of my management team. He's always made a great contribution. And I think from the carer's point of view, Jerry's become a real champion for carers. I think Peter would acknowledge uh, over the last year or so when he's been leading the McKinney Carers uh, portfolio. Okay, uh, so Jerry might want to chip in, but I'll, I'll try and summarise the carers report. Um, I, I know I've got the next three reports and they all have a couple of things in common. Um, they are all kind of interim or progress reports and they all really work around a, a, a kind of set of factors around kind of service user needs or public need our legal powers and duties, uh, demand for services, capacity and growth issues, and then cost. And all those things connect together with an overarching um, imperative of continuous improvement, if you like. So that, that's a kind of framework to see each of the reports in. So I'll try and summarize the carers one. Um, this is a six monthly update on the carers strategy. Overall, it reflects our desire within the strategic plan to provide a greater emphasis on, on the carer role and to provide greater support to carers. Uh, 
that follows up in our December 2019 report. The main points are increasing carer identification at an early stage and, and how we've been working to do that. And I think the, the important uh, table on the second page illustrates that in March, April and May, our numbers increased in the Angus Carer Centre and not in care management. And thinking back over previous reports, that is our direct, desired direction of travel. We want to strengthen our preventative work um, and Carer Centre have been instrumental in doing that. Uh, we've been working on emergency planners for care, uh, planning for carers and the relaunch of the plan, the emergency plan and the, the card. Um, we've been looking quite intensively at weaving, for, uh, char weaving of charges for replacement care, which is now a, a legal duty, um, that is for, for carers are temporarily not available to provide care. And that's quite complicated in, in, in terms of definitions. We're working up a draft policy and procedure uh, in that, and we'll bring that back in a subsequent report. Um, looking at supporting carers in the workplace, um, and there's a, an Angus Council HR group uh, working on that. And that, as you have said, probably at the start, and applies to all three of the reports, that's been delayed due to uh, COVID-19. Quite a lot of our work has been, and I would say in some of these areas, we're about four months behind where we would, would have preferred to be at the moment. Um, Angus Care Centre, key partner for us, functioning really well, uh, but it has had to adapt its methods a bit to COVID like everybody else. Uh, and they're uh, working on an evaluation report just now. Uh, as we mentioned, the lead officer function for the carer strategy will move over to Vivian from the 1st of July. Um, there's a risk in here for us, I think, uh, and it's a financial one, really. I think there's lots of strength in the, the development of the carer strategy. But there's a risk in it, and that's the loss of income from, from carer respite. And as I say, we're working out the, the details of that currently. Um, and I've already uh, kind of mentioned the impact on carers of the loss of this temporary suspension of some of our services during the pandemic. So that, that's it really in summary. I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you, George. I don't know if you should have said Jerry, unless you want to add anything. Um, yeah, well, Jerry, I'll, I'll maybe just add a couple of things. Um, I think one of the achievements which um, we've, we've made since uh, December was um, we've improved our web pages. Uh, so information for supporting unpaid carers uh, is now on uh, the Angus Council on the partnership web pages and, and thanks to Sally for her work to support this as well. Um, so we've got a much more comprehensive public information um, layout for unpaid carers and it links very well with the Carers Centre. Uh, and the only other thing I guess I'd like to say while I've got the opportunity to champion for unpaid carers is um, I would remind um, the IJB that the carer strategy is very much based on carers being equal partners in care. And in some respects, the work that we've done in, in formulating the strategy is the easy bit. The, the making carers feel like equal partners is a real challenge. And I think it's something that we have to live up to because that's what we've signed up for. Um, and I think, you know, carers profile has gone up during the pandemic. I, I worry that it will just, you know, become yesterday's news. Um, but uh, I think people are much more appreciative of what unpaid carers have had to go through during the pandemic at the moment. And I think that's something we want to recognize and, and it gives us an opportunity to review the strategy, young though it is, to see, you know, what have we learned there about unpaid carers and what, what would we want to support more? Um, and what's the priorities? And we'd want to do that in consultation with unpaid carers, of course. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Good stuff. Um, I'm just going to look around to see if we have any hands up. No hands up. Uh, Peter, Peter, and Julie. But Peter yeah, first. Just, uh, yeah, just a, a couple of points. First is about the waiving of charges. Um, if you try and understand the government guidance, you can actually drive yourself mad on uh, trying to understand what they're trying to say. Um, George and I and Jerry and I debated this several times and I don't think we're actually very much clearer um, as to what they're actually trying to intend to, to deliver. Um, just to let you know, this is being taken to the Carers Collaborative, which is the network of IJB carer reps. Um, I'm not sure what will come out of it, but if we do come up with some sort of definition, then certainly I'll bring that back and offer that to the IJB. Um, 
the, the second thing is, um, yeah, I support what Jerry's been saying about making sure that carers don't disappear um, <laughs> under the horizon um, when, when all this is over. Um, because it, it's what's proved, what's been proven is how important they are, how critical they are um, to all of us here. And the final thing is, on behalf of myself and everybody else, the unpaid carers who've worked with Jerry on uh, several aspects of the implementation of the Carers Act, I'd like to commend him for his hard work, um, thank him for all his support of carers, and wish him well in the future. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Julie? Thank you, Chair. Um, I wholeheartedly endorse Peter's remarks um, around um, Jerry's contribution here. I've known Jerry as a colleague as well as being a councillor and a member of the IGP, and I wish you all the very best. Um, and I want, I guess, to reassure Jerry that um, the importance of carers won't go when you do. We all need to be a voice for carers and um, it's been a hugely difficult period for, for those of us with caring responsibilities um, and I, I'm wholly committed to taking forward this agenda in partnership with everyone around this table. Um, and I, I would also like to commend the Carer Centre and Alison Miles for what was a lovely, inspiring Digital Carers Week. Mm. Um, it did make caring very visible. Um, and we need to remember that there are 52 weeks in the year. Uh, and let's, let's continue uh, this work and make sure it doesn't uh, disappear. I'm sure it won't. I'm absolutely sure it won't. So important. And uh, I absolutely agree that the equal partnership uh, needs needs to continue needs to be developed and we need to commit to it as individuals and the organization okay thank you very much julie for that and i certainly i just will go around the room but i certainly would share your your thanks and appreciation <coughs> alison miles isn't with us today but for for all the work that the carers uh, center does um I can't see any more hands up. And if I could be cheeky, I also welcome the additional £275,000 funding from the Scottish Government. That's a, a nice little way to round off that paper. Okay, thank you, Julie. Um, I guess just to, to add again my own comments, if that's okay, but just really by, by echoing everybody's, everybody's words around the table, Jerry, um, and just... Uh, giving you that kind of praise and recognition that you deserve for, for all the works that you've done with carers and with the Carers Centre. Um, and, that, you know, you've been championing and carrying that flag for them to ensure that their voices are heard. And I know certainly the first time that I met you, met, one of the first times anyway that I met you, and we went down to the Go Awards uh, down in Glasgow um, to, I think it was the recognition for Angus's works with the, the Help to Live at Home um, oh, it's indeed, yeah. It was, yeah. So that was one of the first times we met and uh, there was only a few of us and so it was a bit nerve-wracking when you, you don't really know who you're going down there with but um, I'm, I'm dead chuffed because at the end of the night and it's maybe not the healthiest thing to say but I managed to get Jerry to have uh, a, a bag of chips and cheese um, <laughs> at the end of the night and so it just it was one of those special nights where it just yeah he embraced it I was like go Jerry have chips and cheese and we did we <laughs> off the night that way um, but just to say in, in, all, in all seriousness um, just what you said there Jerry about um, carers being equal partners uh, and that's something that you want um, the Angus Health and Social Care Partnership to live up to and I certainly myself and I'm sure everybody around the table will and you know we'll keep pushing that agenda and, and keep plugging hard to make sure that that does become a reality because I'm sure there's many carers right now who you know they're struggling and having a hard time and, and perhaps don't feel like an equal partner or that they have the same opportunities as others to contribute whether that be out in the community or in the workplace um, you know their, their day can be hard and, and often it can be hard to to pull away from those caring duties especially when they're heavy and, and 24 7 so i certainly know i will uh, certainly be be championing to make change um 
probably just to finish with two questions with regards to the carer strategy uh, and probably for George, if it's okay to ask George, mm -hmm. what, what can we do to make sure, I mean, I know certainly from constituents that come to me and um, carers who come and they, they maybe come with various different uh, things that they need support with or are signposted to, but often uh, I, the carers, they don't know that there is a carer's plan uh, or that there is an emergency plan. What can we do to ensure that carers actually are aware that they can have a carer's plan and uh, an emergency plan as well? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's really a, an engagement or communications issue, isn't it? And the problem is, we, when we know the carers, so either if they're a, a kind of level of involvement where they've got care management or where they're known within the, um, the Angus Carer Centre, we should be able to tackle that and make it clear to people what's available and how to, to access the services. If we don't know who's in the caring role, and I suspect we get maybe the top third of the iceberg at any one time, so we, we can't target folk who we don't know. So we'll have to have a look at our general comms, mm -hmm. I think, uh, about more widespread communication and try and just target a bigger population. But we can have a look at that, Lois. Okay. And, you know, we'll pick that up with Vivian and, and when yep. she takes over. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Thanks, George. And again, once again, just to finish off, thanks, Jerry, for all your remarkable works that you've done. Um, and on that, are we all happy to agree the recommendation of Norton? Can I can I just respond to oh. um, to your question and George's response? I think I may have mentioned it before, but the Southwest Locality Improvement Group, one of the four um, initiatives for this year, which has obviously been put on hold, is to help identify carers, unpaid carers, uh, and encourage them to contact either the first contact team or Angus Carer Centre. Um, okay. Because as George says, I think we've got something like 14, 1500 people registered with the Carer Centre and there could well be uh, many thousands of carers out there who are unrecognised. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it's key as well for the staff, George, on the ground within your teams that they're they're having those conversations with carers, yeah. you know, those yeah. that they know um, and that they're, yeah. they're supporting. Yeah. Um, I think, sorry, I think I noticed a couple of, yeah, sorry, George, on you go. I was just going to say, I, I mean, I take it for granted that that is happening, but sometimes it maybe isn't. So we need to prompt that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I did, Julie, did you put your hand back up again? No, no. No. Okay. Was that just, yeah. Okay. So we're happy to agree that report board um, to note yeah. the content. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. We did say as well um, that we would look to bring uh, further progress reports back at six monthly intervals, Lois. Six monthly. Okay, thanks, George. We'll take note of that. Um, that takes us on to agenda item number 10. Um, I should just grab this. Okay, so agenda item number 10 is the physical disability priority improvements. Um, you have the report in front of you and the recommendations, but I can hand you back again to, to George okay, um, uh, to take us through, thank you. I'll do that, I'll, I'll summarise it, Lois, because it's quite a lengthy report. And, and thanks first to Linda Kennedy, who's on the line today, the service leader for disability services, and Fiona Rennie, who everybody knows from the, the planning team, they've done a lot of work on, on, on this, uh, this report and in the background. So members will recall that uh, a specific physical disability service was established in August of 2018. For the reasons that Sandy mentioned earlier, we felt we wanted to drive quality into that, and that physical disability was a, a bit of a bolt-on, and not a very good bolt-on, to older people's services at the time. So we knew that by um, by separating it out, we would, if you like, flush out lots of improvement issues that we would want to, to work on. That nearly always happens when you, you separate a service out and identify it. Um, so uh, we're taking the approach of really to try and get quality and improvement into our future service planning. And the, 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 the approach, as you can see, will look pretty familiar because to a large extent, we're following what we did with learning disability. That approach worked pretty well and we're looking to replicate that with some variation, of course. Um, as I said, we've lost around probably about four months of, of, of momentum on the work. We've been able to do bits and pieces, but not the way we would have wanted to do without, without COVID being there. Uh, so the drive is to develop a three-year improvement plan. Um, and we're looking for approval for the approach and we'll bring back a completed improvement plan probably in August, um, depending on how things progress with the pandemic and how much that, that gets in the way of progress and in the outcome of our engagement work. And the timescales are a bit tight for that. Um, 
thereafter we'll, we'll look to uh, submit six monthly progress reports. Um, the plan's closely linked to the prioritisation uh, of the priority tasks in the, the IGB strategic plan. Uh, the engagement e events that are mentioned, uh, they had to be deferred and rejigged, if you like, uh, so there were no longer any face-to-face -face involvement because of COVID. And we've just concluded the, the survey uh, and we're looking at that and analysing it, and that will feed into the improvement plan once we've had, we've had time to do that. We'll have a draft uh, plan and we'll, we'll uh, circulate that to the public and the, the usual stakeholders for comment. The priority areas identified in the report are the demographic pressures and data collection and, and getting that right because that's been really important in our LD work. Uh, it gives you a strong base for analysis. Uh, review of support packages, uh, services for carers and, and respite and in particular looking at uh, improving respite for people who are under 65, uh, accommodation and housing issues, a review of the day services at Glenloch, uh, and we're, we're including that in our engagement activity to get people's views. Uh, looking at health inequalities, for example, uh, discharge protocols from hospital, including step-down care for, for uh, people with disabilities. Uh, some work on transitions. We, we feel that's a bit underway. We've got a pretty strong transitions working group uh, been up and running for some time, working through on that. Uh, there are financial implications highlighted in the report. Uh, you can see the demographic and inflationary pressures, pressures are challenging uh, for us. And our task is to try to, uh, to contain those a bit. Uh, COVID-19 has already interfered a bit with our, our prospective savings targets and they've had to be reduced to accordingly, as you can see in the report. Um, there is a significant shortfall still between the cost of, of, of what we want and need to do uh, and the available funding uh, for us. And, and over time, that could amount to about £450,000. We think we can absorb about a third of that, uh, but we don't really know yet. So that, that's early stages for the kind of financial assessment and, and Sandy might want to chip in and, and comment on that. So that's it in, in, in summary. It's uh, aspirational but it's uh, strongly rooted in reality because we've been here before and we're, we're, we're taking the same kind of approach. I'll take questions. Happy to do so. Okay, thanks George. Um, should just look around and see if I can see any hands. There doesn't seem to be Karen unless I'm missing anyone. No, I haven't seen anybody on one second screen. Nope. Okay. Oh. No. Do you do you want to come in, Sandy? Is there anything that you want to add? No. No, okay. Okay, so thank you. Um thanks, George. Yeah, Linda, uh, anything from yourself? No. Nope. Sorry, Linda, no, do you want to? You all right, Linda? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to closely, we can all think and summarise each other's views. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. So I didn't want to yeah, think I wasn't giving you the opportunity, but we're, we're good to go on to the recommendations. I shall just read them, read them. Okay, so recommendation 1.1 would be to approve the development of a physical disability improvement plan. 1.2, to note the current issues. 1.3, request the draft improvement plan to be presented at the meeting of the IGB on the 26th of August, 2020, and 1.4, to seek further progress report six monthly. Are we happy to agree those recommendations? Agreed. Yep, thank you. Okay, we are getting there. Thank you for <laughs> bearing with us. Um, as we move on to agenda item number 11, which is the learning disability priority improvements um, and I'm not sure George am I going to you or, or Linda do you want to it's, it's me again and I'll, is it you again okay, if it's chip in as, as, okay. As necessary or request thank you okay uh, thanks Lois um, you know people are, are, are very familiar with the LD priority improvement plan there have been regular updates uh, um, featuring in the IGB and this is the latest progress report so nothing uh, uh, surprising in it, I wouldn't think. Um, you can see the revised financial assumptions uh, are identified in the report. It, it picks up on the key issues and, and updates the plan. Um, again, we're behind where we would wish to be um, and because of COVID-19. One of the, the, the reasons for that 
we had uh, a dedicated planning officer uh, who'd come out of operations and into the, the planning side of this work, but she had to be put back into operations to deal with COVID-19. So that, that took a priority. So that, that's put us behind a bit. So the main features are, and we've touched on some of these before, the prevalence of autism with or without learning disability. It's higher than the Scottish average and accounts for about 38% of our resource allocation. Um, working on accommodation specification for complex needs. We undertake a continuous review of care packages so that we can tackle resources accurately at need and with an emphasis on prevention, as we, we've said before. Um, we're reviewing our high cost residential uh, packages uh, to ensure that we're getting best value for those. Um, Gable's work is ongoing, but the actual building work has been delayed. Building trades been affected quite significantly by the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, we're having to, to delay the start date on that. Uh, the Tusnua residential respite contract was agreed uh, and uh, it's a condition of, of accessibility for wheelchair users and hoist users uh, built into that. Uh, again, the work on the extension at Tusnua has been delayed because of the, the building issues because uh, of the pandemic, so it's just knocked everything back a bit. Um, we've commenced an out of area placement review. Um, and we stress that accommodation needs to meet people's specific needs, and that can be quite delicate and detailed, especially around uh, cases of, of autism. Now, sometimes we do have to do out of area placements, there's no doubt about that, but a point that's worth making is they're much harder su to support than, than uh, uh, local um, uh, arrangements. Um, we're developing tech solutions, um, technology enabled care. I think that's a big area for development. Uh, Sally has a, a whole section in uh, the demand management plan. It's all about tech and we, we covered that in the briefing back in February. Um, the engagement events, as I said, for physical disability as well, have been delayed due to COVID. Uh, and we've changed the approach to that by, by beefing up the survey. We've just had the results from that and we're working on those. Um, the shared cost packages issue with, with NHS Tayside remains unresolved and that has a significant impact on our uh, financial uh, position. Um, and also, uh, as for physical disability, we, we've recognised that COVID-19 has had an impact and our, our savings uh, measures have been mended downwards as a result of that. Uh, that's it. Linda, do you want to add anything? Linda, do you, want, do you want to come in? John, can you unmute Linda, please? Uh, thanks. No, George, once again, that's a great um, summary. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, so happy to take questions, Lois. If anyone okay, asks you. yeah, is any any questions, any comments? Hands up. I'm looking around, George, but I, I think you're... Sandy's got his hand up. Sandy, yeah. Okay, Sandy. Me. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah. Uh, now, now that we've had the physical disability and the learning disability paper together, uh, in both those, uh, George and, and Linda have referred to the fact that there's been some slippage on the savings plans, uh, which is referenced in both the tables. Um, that's not unique to these two programmes. There's been slippage on a number of our uh, savings plans in this financial year. That is an effect that we're capturing as part of the, um, the overall impact, the financial impact of COVID uh, that we uh, referenced in the very first paper. So there's a link between what we're seeing in these tables and that very first paper we saw right back at the start of the agenda. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Sandy. I don't think that there is... Me. Right, Julie, are you there? Sorry. Yeah. Just must okay. have been on the wrong screen, sorry. On you go. It's all right. It's just, just a reflection. It's not a question, but it ties into our previous conversation around the, the mental health development work and the importance, in my view, and the value of having these local services for people with learning disabilities and um, how important that community is, I think. Uh, and, and just to just to pin that thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Julie. I, I appreciate that comment. I, I think I'm quite proud of the work we've done in disability services in the last few years. And, and one of the reasons we've been able to do that successfully and build in all our improvements 
is because we've driven it locally, I think, and the IGB have always been receptive to the changes we've brought forward. You know, it's had rigorous attention. I, I wouldn't want it to be bolted into a much broader mental health plan where it might not get the, the, the recognition that it needs as a, as a separate and, and, and important service. Absolutely. Uh, what gives me comfort was, was the, the aspiration to keep what works well and I would regard this as something that works well locally um, so that, that's what I would be looking to see out of that. Thanks, Peter, Peter had his hand up. Peter, yeah, I noticed Peter's hand, yep. Yeah. Yeah, George, uh, coming back to the survey that was for, for both learning disability and physical disabilities yeah. that um, uh, has recently been run, do you have any view as to um, when we will be able to see the results? Uh, I think they only closed last Friday, the survey. Mm. That's right, Lynn, isn't it? So uh, I, I know that Fiona was having an initial look at that, but I, I don't have a time scale. Linda, do you have a view on, on that? No. Oh. <laughs> As soon as possible, Peter. Everything is getting a bit. <laughs> Everything uh, as soon as possible. Uh, we probably should have given more of a flavour of, of the kind of impact of of COVID on people's time, and you know, yeah. just the sheer volume of that. I mentioned before that in one week I had eighteen COVID-related meetings, and I think in the same week Gillian at Galloway had more. So it's just is it's the same for everybody, and it's just taking making our time scales for things a bit slower, but we'd want to move on that as quickly as we can. Uh, yeah, and, and, and I know that um, Linda's hoping as part of the recovery to get our, our dedicated planner back into, back out of operations and back into planning. Okay. So that, that'll help when that happens. Good, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands. I guess, George, just a couple of things that, um, comments to make or questions. Uh, in terms of, am I right in thinking that in terms of physical disability and learning disability, they've kind of come and gone over the years of being together, then being separate and then back round again. Um, that was just one thought I had. And um, I guess for anybody maybe looking on with a disability, they might wonder, well, it was mentioned earlier today, I think it was on the mental health report around person centred, being person centred. And, you know, how we wouldn't then just view somebody as just the person and not having to necessarily fit them into um, a kind of, a category if you like um, so it's just that's maybe just more comments um, but also just to pick up on uh, the surveys that have gone out uh, and I guess just to, to highlight I guess that um, it's great that there has been responses but as we know um, carers right now are under a tremendous amount of pressure and strain and so there is perhaps people who would who would really be willing to contribute and really want to because they maybe don't feel that they are an equal partner or you know that the service isn't kind of the way that they would like it to be so um so from a service user point of view who maybe would like to contribute or or, or from a carer's point of view um is the feedback going to are we going to kind of is that taken into recognition it's challenging and we might not get a true reflection yes and, and i think that means we have to repeat repeat something a bit further down the line when we get into recovery and try and tease that out a bit more yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. yeah, maybe maybe even just rerun the whole thing because a, yeah. a number of carers are just totally dedicated and focused on caring yeah. for their people. So Get they've got time to do stuff like that. I'll come back on the first point, Lois, but I yeah. think Linda's trying to come in on it as well. Okay, thank you. Linda? Somebody will have to unmute her. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I, I have just had a, I couldn't help myself, I obviously have had to have a, a look at um, some of the responses and we do have, in spite of the difficulties that carers clearly have had, um, we do have some really, really very valuable comments um, and been surprised by the, the, the response that we've had. So hopefully we've got lots to work on. Good. Okay, thank you, Linda. Yeah, did it just on your first observation, Lois, I mean, I, my starting point is that um, people are human beings first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And we don't seek to badge people by, um, you know, a type of disability or a type of presenting problem, but you have to organize your services somehow. And, you know, it, it, there are always pros and cons to how you do it. And you're right, um, certainly in my time, which is seven years, um, at the start of that, when I came into post in 2013, um, 
physical disability was just part of older people's uh, services. And I felt quite strongly that it didn't get um, the attention it needed. And in terms of a kind of dedicated commitment to that particular group of people um, and the, the type of issues that, that, that they had, um, and also our skills development in, in the service. So it probably came from me, but I think I was pushing at an open door with the, the, the services, the general feeling that people had that we should do better. And the way to do that was to, was to have a specialism. Um, okay. And I, I suppose I, my own background in, in, in childcare and child protection work probably influenced that, because I felt that you know, we went to, my first year in Angus went to a specialist um, child protection team. That was underway before I arrived in post. But I think that really raised the skills bar in, in child protection work. Just the very fact that we had a, a group of people dedicated to that particular type of work. And I, I think it, it, over time it will do the same in the physical disability service. Okay, okay, yeah. good stuff. Thanks for that, George, thank you. Um, I'll just do a quick check, just to make sure we're, we're all okay before we move on to the recommendations. It looks fine, Karen. I can't see anybody else, else yeah, got their hands yeah. up. Okay, so recommendation 1.1 of the Learning Disability Priority Improvements is to note the progress made since the last update in December 2019, the current issues and how these are being addressed. Approves the revised financial assumptions from this improvement programme and consolidates this into the IGB's finan strategic financial plan. 1.3 approves the development of an updated learning disability improvement plan. 1.4 requests an updated improvement plan to be presented at the meeting of the IGB on the 26th of August 2020 and 1.5 to seek further progress reports on a six monthly basis. Are we all happy to agree? Yeah. Okay, yeah, looking good. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Um, that takes us on to agenda item number 12, which is our prescribing management. Um, and you have the report and recommendations in front of you. And I shall... First of all, I'll pass you over to, to Gail um, to begin with, and then Gail, you can. Yes, Chair, I'm looking to see if Alison Quinn is Alison still there? Yes. I can't see her. Yeah. Alison, can I can I hand can I hand over to yourself as one of the co-authors of this yeah. in the first instance? Thank That's you. That's fine. Yes, yeah, don't see you. <laughs> I know I've managed to get myself muted so okay. yeah so I've, so at prescribing costs have already been uh, covered in Sandy's update and things are stable so we made a lot of improvements in prescribing and now we've managed to sustain it so we're really looking at making sure we embed that and look for future improvements where possible and as you know we've um, really had a lot of local engagement particularly around our GPs and pharmacy teams but now increasingly actually with our nursing teams in supporting a quality improvement approach that has reduced the amount of items very slightly and reduced uh, the costs um, over, over a period of time with a lot of work behind it. So that continues. Improvement work has did pause for a while with COVID, but we have restarted a lot of that and we've had some really positive conversations around uh, chronic pain improvements, for example, NHS Tayside Wide this week making use of uh, remote technology. Um, Pain Association, for example, has been excellent over this period of COVID and creating Zooms for people in pain and also uh, carers for people who experience pain. So we're continuing that work um, across NHS Tayside and with, within Angus. And the report there also talks about our prescribing of non-medicines and um, there's been some opportunities come as a result of COVID and we're looking really to build this into a future uh, prescribing work plan. And that's things like catheters, uh, wound care products. So really building on a, a, what we were talking about earlier with the quality improvement around care homes where we've got nurses, care home providers, uh, so home care, um, would be involved in this in the future, but looking at how we work together. And I was really heartened yesterday at Angus uh, Prescribing Management Group when the GP said, well, why don't we do this on a locality basis and we'll support it. So we've got really integrated working there. Um, so you have attached a work plan that 
following the meeting yesterday where we had uh, Karen Fletcher lead nurse involved as well, we've got a few additions to that. And as you know, Scott Jameson, our GP prescribing lead, has individualised practice prescribing reports. So I think we're into our third year this year and he <coughs> finished them. So we're going to continue all the things that have worked. Some new things that are coming out that he has an idea about are looking at polypharmacy, not just around people who are frail, but people who have multiple long-term conditions. As you see in our performance report, which is the next um, report, you'll see that we have started to look at our uh, prescribing as an indicator of how we're doing in terms of producing uh, new ways of uh, prevention rather than waiting for people to become unwell. So getting earlier in the process all the time. And of course, we are looking at gabapentin oil, a big um, issue across NHS Tayside around um, drug day. Very important for us also in Angus. So a lot of that work is um, picking up again, and that's included in how the GPs are looking at it. So that's all I wanted to say just now as by way of an update. So continuing on, on much along the same lines, but with new projects added in and extending the amount of professionals that are involved in, in the work plan for the future. Awesome. Thank you very much, Alison. Gail, I noticed that your hand's up again. And just, and just one point really for Alison, and it was around the stoma, um, the stoma bags and the accessories. That was that was there previously. Is there no headway made with that at all, Alison? To unmute. Yeah. So, yeah. There is, there are discussions, but it's going very slowly. I know David Coulson, who is the director of pharmacy in Tayside, had taken that up recently, but we're continuing with that work. It was successful when we trialled it in practice. It's a case of rolling it out. Um, and yeah, the Prescribing Non-Medicines Group starts up again in July, and I know that that's uh, going to be part of the work plan moving forward. But absolutely, all of these um, items um, need to be looked at and that's all part of a programme that Scott's chairing that group. Okay. Okay. Um, Peter. Peter, yeah. Yeah, two points, Alison. Um, I presume at the bottom of page 125 where it's, it's cost per weighted patient, it's a statistical weighting, not somebody who's being served. Um, <laughs> And the other question is, I know we're impacted seriously by COVID, particularly the third sector, but are there any plans to bring um, social prescribing into this report, particularly where we're managing to reduce clinical prescribing um, by replacing it with uh, social prescribing? It's hard, but I keep muting myself. Um, so the bit about the social prescribing absolutely we had a previous report um to the ijb that dis uh, agreed in principle that if we made savings from reducing our gabapentinoids in theory that would then translate into being able to reinvest in other areas social prescribing is part of the primary care improvement plan so it is being reported on there and also it's part of um, the mental health and well-being work that's being taken on. Um, it's difficult to be specific because it's, um, it's quite difficult to show benefit with social prescribing directly in terms of making cost savings. But it's certainly a big part of what we do. And for example, the chronic pain uh, work, uh, we've got the non-pharmacological pain pathway, which was uh, approved just before COVID as we didn't launch it. We've now got agreement to looking at how we launch this, but instead of um, you know distributing it on email, we're thinking about a, a digital platform across NHS side to support outpatient working. So quite innovative ways of thinking across the whole system there. And that is about social prescribing and giving people easy to access resources for clinicians to signpost people to the right places. So that's quite uh, comprehensive. But in terms of a plan that releases uh, distinct benefits that's quite difficult but it is behind the, the chronic pain improvement mental health and general practice okay
Okay, I'm not seeing anybody else that's got a hand up. Um, I think that's that's everything. But I think Alison, just to to finish by saying, you know, an absolute huge amount of work that's been going on and and continues to do so even in the midst of these challenges, um, which will I'm sure as as you say that you know it's brought its its own other set of challenges within. Um, describing, but yeah, well done to you and everyone that's 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 continuing to work away. Um, and on that, we shall move to the recommendations, which is 1.1. Note the content of the paper and the ongoing measures being taken to ensure efficient and effective prescribing within Angus. 1.2. Request a further update to be provided to the Integration Joint Board in December 2020. And 1.3. Endorse the use of prescribing savings to provide sustainable investment in evidence-based models of care including social prescribing. Um, are we happy to agree those recommendations? Thank you. That's great. Good stuff. Um, that takes us on to agenda item number 13, um, which is our annual performance report. And I shall pass you back to Gail to start off. Thank you. Um, yes, by way of information um, for the board, the Scottish Government, through legislation and through engagement with the partnerships, actually agreed that our annual performance plans would be delayed until October of this year and the aim hence was to um, support us on our delivery of the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, in my conversations with the chair and vice chair, they asked if we could um, produce a report. So. Jill Galloway and Vivian Davidson have been working extremely hard to produce this, this condensed performance report for you today. So I'm going to hand over to, to Jill, Chair. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jill. Thank you. Just getting unmuted. Um, yeah, thanks, Gail. Um, and I think traditionally you would have had a, a fuller report um, at the the June um, IGB and as Gail said we felt it was important to highlight some of the um, information that we had um, been able to, to collect um, just to be able to demonstrate that we are still an eye on quality and performance even though we are in quite a difficult um, time period um, noting that we will be able to bring some fuller information later on in the year. Um, I think Vivian will probably want to, to come in and comment as well. I think the condensed report hopefully gives um, the IGB an idea of some of the progress um, that's been made and some of that's very good progress in terms of the um, four key domains uh, and the strategic priorities of the plan. Um, and we are making certainly making good progress in terms of meeting targets for a number of those. Just to, to bring your attention to a couple of them um, in relation to um, falls, I know that previously there was a lot of discussion um, around the, the performance within um, Angus around that. Um, there's been a number of pieces of work undertaken to improve that and since the last time we have um, improved performance. Alison's obviously given an update in terms of overall prescribing, but in terms of the, the key measures here, um, what we are seeing is improved um, and kind of static numbers of those prescribed um, medication for anxiety and depression um, as well as diabetes and I think that picks up on a couple of points. Um, I think it was Peter that made it how we're supporting individuals with some chronic disease management and long-term conditions in a different way um, and using social prescribing um, and obviously support from the, the mental health um, peer support workers as well. Um, just to, to note, um, we acknowledge there is an increase um, in re emergency readmissions. Um, however, our actual emergency admission, admissions, R1, um, have improved. Um, and I think that's given the situation that we have been in is important to note. Um, I will ask Vivian to come in just to discuss the, the readmissions data um, because she's been involved with the list analysts around um, some of the the analysis of that and some of the conversation. Um, we've seen in one of the, the papers that George presented earlier around the, the short breaks um, and we've also seen an improvement or an increase, um, increased performance or improved performance in the um, care home placements as well. Um, 
if it's okay, Chair, just to hand over to Vivian, just to have a discussion around the, the readmissions and also describe um, the, the new proposed um, delivery of the, the public annual performance report as well, if that's okay. Okay, yep, thanks, Gillian. Okay, Vivian, you but okay? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, readmissions is, a, is an interesting uh, set of data. The national uh, measure is one that we don't particularly like. The national measure is a measure of readmissions in relation to the over the total number of admissions to acute care. So the, it includes uh, admissions for children, it includes uh, uh, admissions to every special specialty. Um, so Angus performance looks as if it's uh, worsening. Uh, in part that's because we're in a better position in relation to uh, overall admissions. And the, the number of readmissions is influenced by a small group of people who are frequently admitted uh, during the last few months of life um, and is also influenced by people who are readmission readmitted regularly where the management of or the self-management of a long-term condition like diabetes or a respiratory illness is particularly uh, problematic for them. Our preferred method of looking at readmissions is to look at it as a proportion of the population in the same way that we look at most of the other data as a proportion of the population. If we look at it in that way, readmission in Angus is very low and in fact we are amongst the best performing partnerships in Scotland in relation to that measure uh, considered in that different way. In, particularly, in particular we do very well in relation to readmissions uh, for people aged over 75 uh, with much of our uh, issues for readmission coming from younger um, people and particular and in particular specialties. So we are continuing to have deeper dives into this information and we're considering it um, as part of the unscheduled care board at NHS Tayside as to how we might address uh, readmissions further. Okay. okay. Thanks Vivian. Thank you. I hope that's helpful. Um, now, in, in relation to the publication of the annual performance report, um, yes, Gail is uh, quite right to point out that the Scottish Government have agreed that partnerships are able to publish this later in the year. And the reason for this uh, is partly because, uh, well, mostly, in fact, because national data is just not available. And now this is an issue we have every year in producing the annual report in that we have to benchmark with other partnerships using nationally produced validated data. It is, it is usually just arriving with the partnership two or three days ahead of the IGB receiving the annual report. So it's very difficult to, to get that in anyway. But this year, um, this year has been compounded because we've had ISD moving into the new Public Health Scotland and um, uh, obviously the COVID activity at a national level that have led to de further delays in the availability of the national data. Um, there is a, a huge list of things that we have to include in our annual performance report and largely this report is for the public. It's about sharing with the public our progress against our strategic plan. The comments, the comments I get from the public um, very often say that, the, uh, as, as the IGB have pointed out, our usual um, annual report is, is 60 or 70 pages long. It's difficult to digest and, uh, and is, is quite inaccessible. And it's like that because we have uh, a preset, pre-prescribed content set in the legislation and in regulations that we have to follow 
about what has to be included. This year, we hope to um, try a different approach to the annual report, which would be to use the, IG, the partnership website to display our performance information much more broadly across the whole website, to have a different format uh, altogether on the website. And alongside that, what we would plan to do is um, develop a much shorter summary of something that is three or four pages long with infographics that targets uh, particular measures and directs people to look at the website for more detailed information. We can, of course, still make that available as a, uh, as, as, as a, as a single document should anybody want to uh, read it like that, we can pull the pages together from the website into one document. Uh, but we, we plan to use the opportunity of having a little bit extra time to look at the way we provide the information and try to make it more accessible to members of the public. Thank you, Vivian. Chair, if it's okay if I just come back in on a, a couple of points here. I think in terms of um, going forward, what we do need to do is a bit of further analysis around the impact of COVID on the, the national indicator so that we can clearly see what that impact has been on those outcomes. Um, and just to, to give the, the board assurance that for those areas who are um, not meeting the required targets, that we have got some key actions for improvement um, in place, some of which have been stalled as a result of COVID, um, but if things start to tail off, hopefully, we'll begin to pick them up um, as well. And they will also be included as part of the, the Angus Care model um, and the change programmes going forward as well. Okay. Thanks, Gillian. Thanks, Vivian. Um, very insightful, and I think music to my ears, Vivian, that uh, things are going to be much more accessible. I think that's just crucial that, um, you know, pretty much anyone, you know, everyone has the opportunity to to be able to to pick up uh, our reporting and uh, be able to read it in a way that, that suits them or listen to it. Yes, I, I, hope, I hope so. It's a real big challenge because the information can be quite complex Absolutely. and unwieldy. Yeah. I fully appreciate that, but I think as long as we make efforts to, to at least try and make it more accessible, then you know that's 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 good. That's the best we can do. Um, I'm just looking around to see if anybody has any questions or comments for you. I know it's Hugh's hands up. Hugh. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I mean, I think Gail would be disappointed if I didn't comment. <laughs> <laughs> I would. I would have taken it personally. Yeah. Uh, I'd just like to, to, to thank both Jill and Vivian for the amount of work they've done in uh, coming up with this new format. I really like it. Um, from my point of view, it's, it's clean, uh, what I call uncluttered. It's easy to read, easy to understand, and there's a good balance between the, the visual graph and, and, and the narrative. So uh, and my, my compliments to them. Um, I think what's important as well is the, one of the recommendations which is suggesting that we look at an infrastructure to monitor performance within the, the, the partnership. Um, I mean, my comments have been around the, the sort of format of the performance report more than the content. And it, it, it's hard to, to comment on content at the end of nearly a, a three hour meeting. Mm -hmm. And I think that the performance needs uh, to be considered in more detail than I think we have in the past at the, the board. Um, because they have tended to be lengthy meetings. And I think that in a, a new forum, or whether it's maybe an extension to the audit committee, I don't know, but within a, a new forum, hopefully more time can be spent to do deep dives into the performance and give more consideration. Although having said that, I think some form of performance report still needs to come to the full board from a sort of governance point of view. Um, and, and maybe that is the performance dashboard, which is mentioned in recommendation three, um, but no, I, I, I welcome this support. Okay, thanks, you. Don't see anybody else's hand up. Catherine. Catherine. Oh, 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 sorry, I don't know. 
good. I'm looking a bit, yeah, Catherine and Newcomb. Um, thanks very much. Um, I, I also thought it was a really helpful report. I like the fact that it's fairly short and it's really easy to see what some of the issues might be. Um, just picking up on, on one particular area, um, there's a comment on page 144 um, that it's possible that the reduction in telecare has resulted in an increase in, in the use of personal care. Um, and it's not really for, for exploration here unless the work's been done, but I just wonder whether it may be worthwhile having some more analysis presented to the board um, at a future meeting. Um, for two reasons, and, and firstly, um, because using telecare and not needing personal care is actually a lower, lower level of intervention and it's promoting people's independence um, and that's something that I think that we should be absolutely about. Um, but the other uh, aspect is a financial one, um, which is that I am assuming that the cost of telecare is less than the provision of personal care and therefore it seems that if we've shifted to our charging practice and um, people to a more expensive resource, that might not have been the most sensible approach. So given that that's not necessarily what's happened, I think an unpicking of that might be um, useful for a future meeting. Yeah. We, we would absolutely intend, Catherine, to have uh, a bit more analysis of what's going on given the levels of increase in personal care that we're seeing, the associated uh, downturn in uh, telecare use, but we've also seen a reduction in the use of care home uh, beds, so uh, we, we do need to understand what's going on in personal care because it's going uh, in a direction that um, is greater than we had anticipated. Okay. Thanks, Catherine. I think um, it was Julie. I think Bob. Bob and then, or Bob, Bob. Before me. Bob. And then, okay, Bob, then Julie. And I noticed Alison, your hand's up as well. Bob, yeah, Bob. Um, I've had to switch off my video. My, my uh, internet wasn't doing well. But uh, it was a, uh, a wee bit linked to, to Catherine's last comment. Uh, looking at performance, again, uh, like you, I thought excellent to get this reform, performance report as is. And uh, most of the, the uh, performance targets were, were very good. But on the telecare, uh, the rate dropping, I would have thought that would be totally the opposite, especially in the, the COVID crisis. But maybe these uh, figures were done before the, the COVID crisis kicked in. But, I would have thought that people using telecare would have been a far higher percentage than this, and uh, wondered why that's that's so low. I'm happy to respond to that, um, Chair, if that's okay. Yep. So in terms of the, the data, um, that was up until the end of March, so we won't fully understand the, the full impact of COVID, because obviously that's been um, this financial year from April onward. Um, so there's only been a, a small kind of three-week period um, in this report where COVID has actually been active, uh, so to speak. Okay, thanks for that. Okay, thanks, Gillian. Really? Yeah, mine was, my comment was really just about, um, the, I think the long-term impacts of COVID uh, will, will take a good while to emerge. Um, and it's something that, we're going to be recovering from for a long time and um, even at this stage regardless of whether there's a another wave um, that is going to have such an impact on our strategic plan and and our performance and i would imagine that there, there need to be a national recalibration of some of those targets and i've seen some hands go up so <laughs> but i just i just wanted to reflect that that's a recognition that, mm -hmm. that this will extend the, the period of time where we're bringing in information and analysing it and assessing the impact and help using it to shape forward travel. Okay, thanks Julie. I noticed um, Alison and George's hand up. Alison Clement, do you still want to come in or? Yeah, it was really to follow up Catherine's point about looking at the data about why personal care has increased and I'd be very keen to understand if we're able to have more of an enablement approach working earlier and I think that that could be um, related to a variety of factors so we'd want an open mind as Catherine says but I just wonder about the involvement of our OTs, physios, 
whether there's polypharmacy issues, how we do long-term condition management, and also about the review of some long-term care packages and um, whether or not um, if people have personal care after a hip um, rapture in the winter and they need it at the time, perhaps they wouldn't six months later and do we continue to have an enablement approach throughout the whole of their journey? And I'd just be very interested in that data and would welcome to look at that further and be keen for clinicians to be involved in that too. Okay, thanks Alison. George? Yeah, uh, just to add to what um, um, Alison was saying, first of all, I think when you do anything that changes residential care, it immediately has an impact on personal care and tech and vice versa. Those things are so enmeshed with each other. So I think the way Catherine put it, we need to unpick that a bit as well, put. But the second thing I wanted to come in, just to, to respond to what Julie said about recovery, I maybe should have said this when we were talking about recovery earlier on, we started to do a bit of scenario planning uh, for what the future might look like, specifically around residential care at the moment, but it'll impact on other things because of what I've just said. So um, Jerry and myself and, and Vivian and Pauline Reed have been doing a bit of work on that. And some of that, you're right, Julie, is linked to things that are a bit difficult for us to predict just now. So there might be national initiatives around the future of care homes, for example. But we are trying to, to, to capture the possible scenarios, what they might mean by way of impact for the future, and how we work on those by way of mitigation, or even some things will be positive and we want to promote them. So. Okay, yeah. Thanks, George. I'm just looking round. I can't see anybody else with a hand up. Am I missing anyone, Karen? No, everybody no I think we're all okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, just to, again, just echo what's been said around the room, a huge thank you uh, for the, the huge amount of work that's gone on uh, to, to Gillian and to Vivian. Um, and as we move to the recommendations... Um. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I think that was my peacock. Oh, I wasn't sure. I thought it was a mobile. I wasn't sure. It was a mobile or yeah. Was it your peacock? <laughs> sorry. Okay. Um. So recommendation one point one: approve the new approach to the delivery of a public annual performance report. One point two: consider the report on the data measures and the progress that has been made by the partnership in delivering the ambitions set out in the strategic commissioning plan. 2019 20 to 22. 1.3 requires the Chief Officer to provide a performance dashboard to the IGB biannually and 1.4 note the plan to establish an infrastructure to monitor performance within the Angus Health and Social Care Partnership. Just ask your board, do you agree? Agreed. Agree. Thank you. And, and just before I move on to, or just as I'm moving on to agenda item number 14, just to say again, Jerry, thanks very much and all the best. Uh, for this you this next new chapter in your life um hope it i'm sure it will be a, a, a pleasant journey and you'll have lots of things to keep you keep you going and keep you busy um and also i don't want to finish without actually mentioning um that we have a uh, councillor julie bell my colleague who is also just taken up uh, a position a role within uh, public health scotland so julie just uh, congratulations on that appointment um, and I'm sure that that's not only going to be of benefit to to Scotland uh, you know to nationally but I think you know certainly with an Angus I think you'll be a real credit um, and you know like's been said earlier um, it couldn't have come at probably a more crucial time um, in many Absolutely. ways thank you thank you Lois appreciate right. that it's it's an amazing opportunity to be part of a new organization when public health has never been more prominent in in the the public eye um, and I just hope I do it credit. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. Um, and that takes us on to agenda item number 14, which is the date of our next meeting. And I will hopefully look forward to seeing you all on Wednesday, the 26th of August, 2020. And I think it'll most likely be uh, in this format again, no doubt. Um, so thanks everyone and take care. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye